Marsha. 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 Are you ready? I don't know. I wish I could do this every year. As you wish. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Twilight Tober Zone has returned. Thanks to all your excitement and feedback over last year's coverage, I'll be reviewing the next 31 episodes of this classic sci-fi anthology series. As we finish up Season 1 and move into Season 2, we'll discuss how the show grew and changed in its sophomore year, from Rod Serling appearing on screen at the beginning of every story, to the infamous handful of videotaped installments, there will be much to break down and talk about. A few fan-favorite episodes are in this batch too, including Eye of the Beholder, The After Hours, Night of the Meek, and The Invaders, along with some gems you don't hear about as often like Nervous Man in a $4 Room and The Howling Man. We'll get into more behind-the-scenes information from Mark Zickrey's The Twilight Zone Companion book and tell you how some of these classics came into being. Just like last year, I'll be revisiting 31 episodes of the original series throughout October. That's one video per day, all month long. Make sure you tune in as we continue this journey together, traveling deeper into the heart of the Twilight Tober Zone. Welcome one and all to the beginning of Twilight Tober Zone 2021. We're starting this year's marathon with an episode that many critics and fans remember well and praise abundantly, that being a passage for Trumpet. This was the first of four episodes starring Jack Klugman, he's tied with Burgess Meredith for the most lead character appearances in the series. It also featured the debut of John Anderson, another actor who'd show up a handful of times, and was directed by Don Medford. Medford returned to the Twilight Zone to helm four more installments, including one with Klugman. This also wasn't his first foray into the genre, as he directed 30-plus episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. For more information on that show, check out last year's review of What You Need. In a passage for Trumpet, a down-on-his-luck alcoholic musician named Joey Crown has hit rock bottom. None of his old friends want to play with him anymore because of his drinking, but Joey says the only time he feels worthwhile is when he's drunk. After selling his trumpet for booze money and going on another bender, he attempts to commit suicide by jumping in front of a truck. When he wakes up, he doesn't recognize any of the people in the neighborhood, and none of them react to his attempts at interaction. Thinking he's a ghost, Joey wanders around until he meets a man who can actually see and hear him. This man also plays trumpet, and informs Joey that what he's experiencing isn't exactly what it seems. This episode all hinges on the likability of Jack Klugman's portrayal of Joey Crown. Most notably known as Oscar Madison in the Odd Couple TV series from the 1970s and other projects like the classic film 12 Angry Men, Klugman plays an earnest, very authentic feeling character in his first trip to the Twilight Zone. You do root for Joey on his journey to find what he's looking for. In this case, it seems to be a reason to live. With Rod Serling behind the writing here, Crown is a character archetype that pops up in a decent amount of his stories. The monologue Joey goes off on at the beginning of the episode has Rod's fingerprints all over it. I can't even talk to people, Baron, because this horn, that's half my language. Klugman isn't actually playing whenever the character is shown emitting a few notes, but he did go out of his way to receive lessons so that at least his mouth position and finger movements would come off as genuine. It's not too distracting, and better than a lot of other similar situations in movies and TV, where the actor is obviously not familiar with the instrument their character is supposed to be an expert in. That little extra effort by Klugman was appreciated, even if he did play with his mouthpiece a little too much. There's a lot of charisma in Joey beneath his melancholy demeanor. You can see where the actor injected life into the character with little spontaneous lines and movements, especially after Crown realizes he's dead. I'm haunting you! I'm a booch, booch. In that same scene, Joey is further convinced he's a ghost by the absence of his reflection in a nearby mirror. There were a lot of different ways this type of thing was pulled off back in those days, but they really went the extra mile in this episode. They constructed a duplicate set and went as far as to cast identical twins for the ticket taker in her booth. 
As a result, they were able to show more of the mirror for a very impressive practical effect. Now, they did put glass in the frames, and if you look closely, Joey's reflection is faintly there, and on other reflective surfaces in this realm. But those are just small blemishes on an otherwise well-done sequence. There's another well-done standout moment from earlier when Joey is hit by this truck. It actually is pulled off pretty believably. The choice of dynamic and moving shots in combination with the stunt work and those quick cuts made this a believable collision. We had seen this done less effectively in, again, what you need. In this case, well-executed editing far exceeded sped-up footage. The woman's reaction and that snap zoom really sold this too. Aside from the movie theater exterior, the sets were some of the simplest built for an episode. One of the little easter eggs you can catch outside the club is a banner for Houghton and Houghton Construction. This was a nice little reference to series producer Buck Houghton. Of course, a lot of these decisions we can attribute to the show's regular cinematographer, George T. Clements. Apparently, when Rod Serling and Buck Houghton were on set for a visit, he exclaimed to them that director Don Medford was making this episode as if it were an hour long. Convinced it was shaping up to be one of the best pieces he had ever made, Clemens tried to push them to make it a two-parter, or convince CBS to give them a full hour for the installment, but this didn't happen. Clemens would say that the final piece was cut to shreds. While Medford did later direct one of the rare hour-long episodes of the show, it does make one wonder what we missed out on with this episode. It's already considered a classic by many admirers of the series, so would it have actually been better or too bloated with the bonus content? That's a mystery we'll never have an answer to. Eventually, Joey runs into a man playing the trumpet who acknowledges his presence. Surprised, Crown's offered a chance to play. He takes the man up on his offer, and it's then revealed Joey isn't dead after all. All the people he didn't recognize in town are actually the ghosts, but they don't know they're dead yet. Joey is in limbo, in between life and death. The stranger asks Crown which he preferred, and after some reflection on the positive aspects of his existence, he chooses life. The man compliments Joey on his exceptional talent and walks off, when Crown asks his name. Call me Gabe. Gabe. Short for Gabriel. With that, Joey wakes up on the sidewalk unharmed, is given a few bucks by the driver to not report the accident, and buys his horn back. Later, we see him up on his roof playing when he's approached by a woman named Nan. New to the city, she asks if Joey can show her around, and we end on a happy, fulfilled note. First off, in my probably unpopular opinion, John Anderson outshines Jack Klugman in just his one scene as Gabriel. He absolutely nails the essence of an unthreatening, helpful, guiding force. It's very hard to do that without coming off as insincere or contrived, but from every line read to minute facial expression, Anderson embodies a welcoming, kind, and thoughtful divine manifestation. That's a nice talent you got, to make music, Move people? That's an exceptional talent, Joey. Don't waste it. The circular light above his head acting as his halo is pitch-perfect visual storytelling. This character was portrayed fantastically in all aspects. By far my favorite part of the episode. The Nan character, presumably again named after Serling's daughter, is a nice touch at the end of the story. The actress, Mary Webster, would show up in another Klugman-starring Medford-directed episode called Death Ship in Season 4. Overall, this is a nice little heartwarming story to fit in with the likes of One for the Angels, Walking Distance, and The Big Tall Wish. While not quite on the same level in terms of quality for me, it's still a nice break from the show's signature sci-fi and more prominent supernatural themes. I'd recommend it if you're looking for Rod Serling's take on something like It's a Wonderful Life. And if this doesn't sound like your cup of tea, fear not. We have a whole month's worth of episodes to get through this year as we travel deeper into the Twilight Zone. Mr. Beavis is not a good episode. It's comedically forced, poorly paced, and lacks the depth of even the mediocre installments of the original Twilight Zone series. But there are a few notable details about it. This includes its connection to one of the show's best episodes, Time Enough at Last. 
I was able to review that one last year, so you can check out my thoughts there, but the character of James B.W. Beavis ties directly to Burgess Meredith's portrayal of Henry Bemis. Let me explain. Rod Serling loved Meredith's work so much after the success of Time Enough at Last that he wanted Burgess to star in a series he was developing especially for him. He wrote the pilot episode, but the star wasn't interested in doing another television series and turned it down. Serling then decided to rework the pilot as a standalone Twilight Zone episode, and Mr. Beavis is what we were left with. Swapping out the M for a V, the character is still a bumbling, harmless, and unfocused person. You can see where Meredith might have excelled in a few of the situations, but if the original script was very similar to this one, I'm not sure even Burgess himself could have saved it. This was one of producer Buck Houghton's least favorite episodes. In Mark Zickrey's The Twilight Zone companion book, he was quoted about the installment. Quote, Somehow, it just didn't come together. It was apples and oranges. I didn't think there was any excitement or interest. You just wondered, why watch it? End quote. Following the excellent usage of an angelic character in a passage for Trumpet, Mr. Beavis continued that element with an attempt at a more comedic depiction of the archetype. James B.W. Beavis is a scatterbrained young man who's constantly late on his rent, getting fired from job after job, and just can't seem to hold his life together. However, he is well-intentioned, good-natured, and a kind soul. After getting fired, evicted, and watching his car roll into a wreck in the same day, Beavis ends up at a local bar where he's confronted by J. Hardy Hempstead. Hempstead is Beavis's new guardian angel and has been watching over his ancestors for centuries. He gives Beavis the chance to start the day over again, except this time, things will turn out more in his favor. The only catch is that certain things about James will be seen as altered by other people. Essentially, he'll be viewed as a whole new Beavis. Hempstead starts the day over, and while Beavis is respected by his landlord and boss, no one remembers the kind-hearted person he once was. The friendships he had formed with the local kids and neighbors no longer exist, and this leaves James to ponder what's truly important. William Asher was well known both before and after this for directing hundreds of episodes for comedy shows like I Love Lucy and Bewitched. It makes sense that they choose him for a script such as this one, but it obviously just wasn't a good fit for something like The Twilight Zone. Thus, Mr. Beavis would be his only credit for the show's run. Humor can work in the series from time to time, but when a whole episode is centered around it, it becomes a tough sell after hearing that music and seeing that logo. Speaking of which, this and the remaining Season 1 episodes were the only episodes in the first season that featured a different intro. We still haven't reached the show's most well-known theme, that starts in Season 2, but this one has a change in music and looks very different from what came before. It's characterized by a close-up of an eye closing, a black line appearing at the bottom of the screen, and a new, more basic logo. But with only a few installments left in Season 1, this changed pretty quickly. You can make an argument that this second Season 1 intro was a bit creepier with less of the dreamlike quality the original had, so that makes it even stranger to see it in front of an episode like Mr. Beavis. You can tell the cast is trying, but the material just wasn't working. Everyone feels off. It's like a Twilight Zone episode of The Twilight Zone if The Twilight Zone was supposed to be an early 1960s sitcom. Are you serious? The only thing that's missing is a laugh track. Even the effects don't really hold up. Usually, the crew was able to come up with a practical solution to fit the budget, and more often than not, it worked. Here, though, there's a scene where Hempstead walks through a glass door that was poorly put together and timed incorrectly, so they had to slow down the footage of the bottom layer of the film to make it match. In a better episode, this wouldn't stick out, but here, it's one of the only moments worth discussing. There is this disturbing clock that doesn't exactly hold up very well either, and they even use it as the image the credits play over, so... There's that too. There's not much of a twist here. Anyone could see it coming from miles away. But Beavis convinces Hempstead to set things back to the way they were, and James lives his life happily as the clumsy, idiosyncratic underdog he used to be. Except this time with a little help now and then from his guardian angel. Is this one of the worst episodes of The Twilight Zone? Maybe. I don't like using the word worst to describe anything about this show, but this one is definitely an outlier in a sea of great concepts, scripts, and productions. It's a rare miss. Perhaps it's best we leave Beavis with Butthead and leave this installment way in the back of the Twilight Zone. The 
After Hours is one of the creepiest episodes of The Twilight Zone that I can remember. The concept of mannequins coming to life is something I think a lot of people have imagined as kids or even later in life. I know I have. The execution of this one is where it shines most. Director Douglas Hayes was back, and he made full use of the bigger-than-usual set they were able to work in. Cinematographer George T. Clemens utilized a lot of different techniques to bring forth the feeling of paranoia and fear that was at the center of this episode. Anne Francis plays the lead in the After Hours, and she is a real standout, not just among the female protagonists in the series, but of any main character the show had to offer. There was a confidence and self-assuredness to her portrayal that made where this story went all the more tragic. Francis was a pretty big star at the time, and even acted in the Twilight Zone's favorite movie, Forbidden Planet. She did return to the series one more time in Season 4's Jess Bell, which was a vast departure from her role here. This is one of those episodes that was just firing on all cylinders. Let's explore why. Marsha White is searching the department store for a gift to give her mother, specifically a gold thimble. When a separate elevator opens near her, she's invited inside by the operator and taken to the ninth floor. The doors open to reveal an emptied space with no merchandise. That is, except for one peculiar woman who sells Marsha the thimble she's looking for and knows her name without White telling her. Marsha leaves confused and quickly notices scratches and dents on the thimble. When she informs the store managers about her encounter, she's told there is no ninth floor in the building. Flustered, she passes out in the office area and wakes up to discover the store closed and everyone gone. What follows is an experience straight out of a nightmare. Douglas Hayes directed one of my favorite episodes of this show, Elegy, from earlier in the first season. I reviewed it last year, and that installment, much like this one, still holds up. Hayes helmed nine episodes in total, with even more classics that we'll get to soon, but I think the After Hours really has a tone and atmosphere all its own. The way everything is shot and lit with an absence of music and some of the most suspenseful scenes helped make this one a choice pick of many fans. While Anne Francis leads the cast brilliantly, she's not the only actor who shines in this installment. Elizabeth Allen has the perfect amount of mystery and apathy that ups the intrigue of the story. The same can be said about John Conwell as the elevator attendant. James Milholland brought a lighter comedic approach to an otherwise very serious episode as Mr. Armbruster. The levity was appreciated. He was a well-known comedic actor who specialized in some almost cartoonish body language and facial expressions. He would appear in two more Twilight Zone episodes following this one. Most everything else I have to say about the After Hours is a spoiler, so I'd encourage you to watch the episode if you can before hearing the rest of my thoughts. It's a twist I didn't really see coming the first time I viewed it. Upon being left in the store alone, the mannequins start calling Marsha's name and even seem to be moving. Freaked out, she ends up in the elevator alone that leads once again to the elusive ninth floor. Once there, all the mannequins, including one resembling the saleswoman from earlier, come to life. Slowly, she's reminded that she's actually one of them, a mannequin herself. They all take turns living among humans for 30 days at a time. Marsha had been so comfortable in her role as a real person that she had forgotten what she really was. The nameless mannequin who sold her the thimble then departs as it's her turn to venture out into the real world. This leaves Marsha to somberly transform back into her true state. And the next day, Mr. Armbruster sees a mannequin that looks exactly like Marsha on the sales floor. He shakes off an eerie feeling as Rod's narration kicks in and the episode ends. Maybe not a completely unexpected twist, but it still hits hard. What sells it is Anne Francis's superb acting. We had seen her so sure of herself earlier in the episode that when we have to watch her resign to the sad truth, it creates an enormous amount of sympathy. It was Francis's idea to have Marcia slowly revert to her rigid pose and have her once prominent emotions fall away. The rest of the mannequin characters were played as cold to exemplify their lack of humanity. The climactic sequence that leads to this realization is extraordinarily creepy. It starts with the anticipatory silence of the empty store and slowly ramps up. One of my favorite shots in the episode is when we see Marsha trying to leave the locked floor. She earnestly asks for help as we see her distorted image through the pebbled glass windows. Then the voices start. Marsha, <gasps> you remember Marsha? Climb off it. Come on, dear. Marsha. 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 That's chilling stuff. 
Her reaction to all that comes off as more believable than some other episodes where the main character goes mad or just loses it. The confident exterior that we watch through the whole episode is peeled away as she turns into a frightened, terrified, and confused mess. It's great work. That big reveal shot at the ninth floor still gets a reaction from me too. The music finally kicks in there and later changes to solemn tones that start to reveal the real tragedy of this story. They used the trick of switching out the mannequin and the actor in the elevator, which is just perfect. They did that a few other times too, and it always worked remarkably well. Those three mannequins of the actors were accomplished by using a face cast and creating a head, mounted on the model bodies. Credit to William Tuttle, the very talented head of the makeup department who we've mentioned in this series before, and his assistant Charles H. Schramm for the life casts and making these doubles look just realistic enough. This was definitely the way to go, but producer Buck Houghton wasn't so sure at first. Originally, they thought of just having the actors strike frozen poses or covering their faces in wax, but I think most of us can agree they came to the correct conclusion with Tuttle and Schramm's Uncanny Valley Dummies. This was another great script from Rod Serling that was brought to its full potential by the cast and crew. In Mark Zickrey's The Twilight Zone Companion book, he theorizes that this episode was influenced by the John Collier short story, Evening Primrose. In that story, a department store and living mannequins both play large roles. But regardless of its influences, this one plays off basic illogical fears and leads to very realistic allegories. Self-doubt, leaving one's home or family, or even trying to achieve more than your peers think you can, while in the end being dragged back down to that perceived reality, all add up to the after hours, equating to a horrifying, layered tale. So I guess it's a slightly better mannequin story than A Mom for Christmas, but it is close. The Mighty Casey has quite the history behind it. It's so interesting, in fact, that it's more entertaining than the episode itself. Before we get into the breakdown of the story, let's discuss what exactly happened and how this installment of the series could have been very different, for not so good reasons. This episode was supposed to air much earlier in the first season, but as you can see by its order here, it ended up being released as the second to last in that initial run. This was because of extensive reshoots done eight months after the original production. The manager of the Hoboken Zephyrs, the baseball team in the episode, was at first played by Paul Douglas. They went through the entire shoot and wrapped production. The next day, Douglas died of a heart attack. His symptoms were said to be very visible on camera with frequent shortness of breath and discoloration. It was to the point where Rod Serling called Douglas' manager to complain. Apparently, he had been known to have issues with drinking, and that was the thought Serling had, but Douglas' oncoming heart attack was the actual culprit. The post-production team cut together a full version of this episode, which Serling showed to the executives at CBS. Rod was understandably uncomfortable with using some of this man's last moments in what was supposed to be a lighthearted comedy. He wanted CBS to not air it and just eat the costs, but they didn't go along with that. The executives also shot down Serling's idea of paying for reshoots with another actor in the lead role. So, Rod paid $27,000 out of his own pocket to hire a replacement, Jack Warden, and reshoot the scenes needed. With Warden now playing the main character, this was not a short reshoot. They used everything they could from the original production, including close-ups of the other actors and wide shots, but everything with the manager character had to be filmed again. In the end, Serling did what he always did and got the job done. We'll discuss the results in a minute, but this was unquestionably the more ethical route to go down, and in my opinion, says a lot about Rod Serling's admirable qualities. The Hoboken Zephyrs are by far and away the worst team in Major League Baseball. Their manager, Mouth McGarry, is pessimistic on the chances of the club's improvement anytime soon. One day, he's approached by a Dr. Stillman, who brings in a young man named Casey for a pitching tryout. Casey proves to be like nothing the manager has ever seen, and that's when Stillman tells McGarry the truth. Casey is a robot. McGarry agrees to take on the humanoid machine as his new ace pitcher as long as Stillman keeps quiet about what he really is. The doctor concurs, and Casey leads the Zephyrs on a huge win streak. But when he's beamed in the head by a ball a few months into his run, the team doctor examines the pitcher. Naturally, he discovers Casey isn't exactly what he appears to be. This is one of the only episodes with two directors credited. 
Alvin Ganser led the original production with Paul Douglas, but was unavailable for the reshoots. Robert Parrish was then brought in to finish the scenes with Jack Warden in the central role. I'm sure Douglas's portrayal of another baseball manager, Guffey McGovern, in the 1951 version of Angels in the Outfield landed him this part, but seeing Warden's comedic delivery and dry wit works as well as can be here. All right, I see, I see. Rod Serling's strength was never writing for comedies, at least not in the Twilight Zone. But this isn't too bad. It's a very basic premise that's raised a bit by Warden's acceptable performance as the ornery McGarry. If you recall, Warden appeared in another episode earlier in the season. I made Casey. I built him. He's a robot. Not a robot! This guy just can't get away from robots. Robot! Right, right, robots. The Lonely is without a doubt a much better, more memorable episode. The Mighty Casey has a few charming moments, though. The actors do a fine job, and as a baseball fan, it was nice to see Rod take on a story featuring the sport. They even shot this episode at Wrigley Field. No, not that dump. The Los Angeles version that was torn down in the late 60s. Minor league teams played at the park the most, and movies and TV shows used it frequently. When I was a kid, I used to watch reruns of the old Home Run Derby show on ESPN Classic, and they shot at this very stadium during this same time period so it was nice to discover that little connection. After Casey is beamed by a comebacker, which is not seen on screen, even though they show him get hit in the head earlier, and the doctor discovers he's not human, the commissioner is brought in to disqualify him from playing. But McGarry and the general manager, Beasley, try to convince the commish that Casey is basically human. They decide what's missing is a heart. How could he be human without a heart? Beasley hasn't got a heart either. He owns 40% of the club. That's it, gentlemen. He doesn't have a heart. Dr. Stillman pledges to give Casey a heart, and he's allowed to continue playing. The pitcher shows up just before a big game against the Giants with a very different attitude. He smiles now, has emotions and empathy. Because of this, he refuses to strike out any of the batters on the other team, which means the Zephyrs get walloped. After the game, Casey quits the team to try and help people as a social worker. Stillman explains that giving him a heart without the experience to understand competitiveness resulted in his current attitude. Creator and creation walk away, but not before Stillman leaves Casey's blueprints as a memento. Inspiration then strikes McGarry, and he rushes out to Stillman with an idea. Serling explains in the ending narration that the team was abolished soon after, but unsubstantiated reports have suggested that they moved out west under a new name with a pitching staff that had stuff like nothing human and won them several world championships. Again, this isn't a strong episode of the show, but I think it deserves some leeway considering the troubled production history behind it. Plus, it has an old-fashioned newspaper montage, come on. It's not one I would go out of my way to rewatch, but if you ever want to take your chances at the plate against the mighty Casey, he'll be waiting for you in the Twilight Zone. A World of His Own features a perfect concept for the Twilight Zone. Written by Richard Matheson and directed by Ralph Nelson, this was the finale of season one, both in production and airing order. It capped off an extremely successful debut set of episodes on CBS and assured the show would be back with more soon after to appease its growing creative fan base. Gregory West is a well-known playwright who's sharing a romantic drink with a young woman named Mary. Soon enough, Gregory's wife, Victoria, arrives home to catch a glimpse of her unfaithful husband through a window. However, when she enters the room, there's no trace of Mary. Slowly, Gregory tells his wife that he has the ability to speak his characters into existence through his dictation machine. Mary was just that, one of his characters. When he destroys the piece of tape any of those characters are recorded on, they disappear, or as he put it, uncreated. Victoria thinks he's lying and threatens to have him committed, followed by a divorce. Gregory, though, is determined to prove to his wife that he's telling the truth, and the whole situation ends up being much more than Victoria West bargained for. This was the only episode that Ralph Nelson directed, but it was the third that Richard Matheson wrote for this first season. Keep in mind, Rod Serling adapted two short stories of his earlier on as well. Matheson was pleased with the cast and direction, having been on set to watch the filming, and enjoyed the end result. 
But originally, he had pitched this to Serling and producer Buck Houghton as a much more serious episode than the final comedically toned product ended up being. A short story of Matheson's, and now I'm waiting, was the basis for a world of his own, and it had what was described as a more nightmarish quality involving the character and his creations. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a Twilight Zone classic waiting to happen. For whatever reason, it was suggested that he reform the idea as a domestic comedy, and while I certainly don't think it feels comedic the entire time, it works just fine as is. I do wonder what a truer adaptation of And Now I'm Waiting would have looked like as the final episode of season one, but oh well. The original short story was later published in a 1983 edition of Twilight Zone magazine. The cast here was only made up of three people. Well, technically four, but we'll get to that. Mary LaRoche played Gregory's creation Mary, and she would pop up in one more episode down the road in season five. Phyllis Kirk was cast well as the snobby wife of Victoria, incredulous to her husband's ridiculous sounding story. Gregory himself was played by Keenan Wynn, the son of legendary comedic actor Ed Wynn, who made two memorable appearances in the Twilight Zone himself. Those were in season one's One for the Angels and season five's 90 Years Without Slumbering. There was something very strange about Keenan's performance, and I couldn't put my finger on it until I looked him up after this last rewatch. It makes perfect sense that he's Edwin's kid. He has some strange, creepy delivery at times, combined with one scene of very believable pantomime. Of course he's the son of a vaudeville star. It totally makes sense now, and I look at this episode a little differently as a result. You are stark, staring, raving mad. You shouldn't say those kind of things, Victoria. Then you stay, hmm? There's a point where Gregory brings an elephant to life inside their house to prove he's telling the truth, and the production team got an actual elephant on set for the bit. It's impressive even today to see this unexpected moment. Originally, they were thinking of ways to get around it, including rear projection, but Buck Houghton didn't think it looked realistic enough, so they went out and got a real elephant. The visual of the animal in the hallway made for an extraordinary sequence. While Victoria eventually buys into Gregory's story, she tells him that the first chance she can escape, she'll have him put away. West feels he has no choice and brings out a safe with an envelope inside. Victoria's name is written across the front as a stretch of tape is shown to her. Gregory says that Victoria is also a creation of his. Thinking he's bluffing, she throws the envelope and tape into the fireplace herself. As it burns away, Victoria starts to feel strange and soon enough, she disappears. Gregory runs back to his dictation machine to recreate her, but thinks better of it, and instead brings back Mary one last time. Except now, she's written as his wife, and the new pair begin to live a seemingly happier life. Usually, that'd be the end, but we then see Rod Serling himself on set for the closing narration. We want you to realize that it was, of course, purely fictional. Rod! I mean, you shouldn't say such things as nonsense. And ridiculous. Well, that's the way it goes. This had never happened. Serling was always on screen at the end of each episode to preview the next week's story, but he was never actually in an episode before. The addition of Gregory interacting with him was a really nice touch from Matheson as this wrapped up season one. The only thing that would have been funnier is if he didn't have a voiceover narration following this. Either there should have been none or the Gregory character or someone random could have done it. Starting at the beginning of season two, Rod appeared in the flesh at the beginning of every episode. I like this story. It's not Matheson's best, especially following how great a world of difference was, but the premise, Keenan Wynn's odd performance, the live elephant, and the ending bit carry this one to memorable status. They finished shooting and thus ended production of season one in April of 1960, but it wouldn't be long before everyone was treated to more of these twisted tales. The Twilight Zone's second season kicked off with King Nine Will Not Return. Naturally, since it was the second season premiere, there's quite a bit of background on the production. This includes the actual event the story was based on, the main actor's involvement in the show, how the episode was received, CBS's budgetary concerns, and more. 
After winning numerous awards, including an Emmy for Rod Serling's writing in 1960, this series was riding high heading into the debut of a new set of episodes. The fan base was large and engaged enough to send in dozens of story ideas every week, purchase books and other merchandise based on the show, and they even started to recognize Rod in public. He had been known by people within the industry because of his other mainstream work, but The Twilight Zone gave Serling a new level of fame with the average Joe. The show's return was heavily publicized after CBS announced its renewal on May 11, 1960. Fast forward to September 30th of that same year, and the hotly anticipated second season finally hit the airwaves. A new intro accompanied the premiere, as the classic theme by Marius Constant we all associate with the show debuted. The on-screen visuals look as if they combine certain aspects of both Season 1 intros. We still start by moving through dense mist, but we meet the black line and sun that is signature to the show's second introduction. The original Twilight Zone logo ends this more abbreviated presentation, as Serling's narration is slightly altered. Speaking of Rod, this is the first time we see him on screen at the beginning of an episode. It wasn't his original appearance overall, but this started a tradition for the show that continued through the remainder of its run. Other potential narrators were once again brought in, however it was Rod himself who ended up being the perfect fit. King Nine Will Not Return follows Captain James Embry in the moments following the crash of his plane in an African desert. The year is 1943, as he awakens to find the aircraft damaged and his entire crew missing. In the sweltering heat, he searches for them, only to be greeted with mirages as his mind starts to succumb to the hot desert sun. After a while, he sees jets fly overhead that don't fit the time period. Captain Embry continues his delirious wandering as the truth slowly reveals itself. This episode was based on a real event in the news at the time, which concerned the discovery of an American bomber called Lady B. Good that actually went missing in 1943. It was found in the late 1950s with most of the supplies intact and even the machine guns and radios still operational. However, the remains of the crew on board were not immediately recovered. It was brought to light later that the crew bailed with their parachutes into the desert below and died trying to find the Mediterranean coast. The Twilight Zone wasn't the only piece of media to draw inspiration from this tragic situation. The 1964 novel The Flight of the Phoenix, which was later turned into two films with the same name, had a similar premise. The second film, a remake of the first, was released in 2004. Soul Survivor, a 1970 TV movie, also based its story on The Lady Be Good. Buzz Kulik directed his first of nine episodes here, and if Serling had his way, he would have directed even more. The two were friends, and Rod had recruited him as early as season one, but Kulik's schedule didn't permit him to start working on the show until this season two installment. Another friend of Serling's was this episode's star, Robert Cummings. At the time, he was known as a comedic actor for projects like the five-season-long sitcom The Bob Cummings Show, although he did do more dramatic roles like a 1958 episode of Playhouse 90 called Bomber's Moon, which was written by Serling. As the lone actor for most of this episode, his performance was lauded as a tour de force by critics. The whole episode actually received ample praise from publications at the time. One of the conditions for Cummings signing on to appear in Twilight Zone was that if his acting was well received, Rod Serling would submit this episode and his performance for an Emmy. Reportedly, Serling had to go back on his word when another episode, Eye of the Beholder, was said to have a better chance at winning that year. Serling and Cummings almost collaborated again on a Western show that Serling pitched called The Loner. It ended up being made in 1965 and lasted one season, but Cummings was not involved in the project. Despite the show's popularity, CBS often tried to keep the show's budget down. It was very expensive to produce at the time, with this episode alone costing almost $62,000. This resulted in several shortcuts in production that were clever at certain times and more obvious in others. One of the more unfortunate ideas to cut costs involved shooting six episodes of this second season on videotape. We'll get to those later, but with most of the series shot on film, the quality drop in those installments stick out like a sore thumb. Another trick was to keep the cast to a minimum, which is one of the reasons why the Captain Embry character is alone for the majority of this story. Despite being the only person on screen for such a long time, he has quite a bit of dialogue. To avoid the problem of the character talking out loud in excess, as Serling himself admitted was the case in the series' very first episode, Where Is Everybody?, narration is used a few times for some of the more reflective monologues. 
Cummings actually recorded those lines before the on-location shoot in the desert. They played them back for him to react to, as we see in the episode. Or maybe I tied one on and I'm in a booth at a bar someplace with a pretty girl. After hallucinating more and more, Embry starts to put together that his thoughts don't match up. He doesn't remember how he got there or what he did immediately before. Recognizing the 1960s era jets flying overhead further confuses him. Jet aircraft? How do I know about jet aircraft? This is 1943. There's no such thing as jet aircraft. But I know about it. Embry pleads with whoever may be listening to let him out of this nightmare. And soon after, we see him in a hospital bed. A medical doctor and psychiatrist explain that he went into shock and fainted after seeing a newspaper headline that says an old warplane was recently discovered in an African desert. In World War II, Embry was captain of that very aircraft, but was suffering from fevers and reported in sick before it went on its final mission. His survivor's guilt was triggered by the newspaper's story, and this resulted in his delusion of being stranded in the desert alone with the plane he never went down with. Soon after, the doctors leave the room and unexplainably discover sand in his shoes. That sand in the shoe bit was another element left over from Where Is Everybody? Serling wanted to leave a similar clue in that episode after the main character came out of his altered state, but the network thought it would be too confusing for the viewer. That was the pilot episode, so they didn't know what a big hit the series would be for twists like that. But by this point, Serling had proved himself with the series, and that beat was of course allowed this time around. While this episode and Robert Cummings' performance were heavily praised at the time of release, personally, I don't think it holds up very well. While the on-location setting and real plane was appreciated, it lacked any variance in atmosphere and the same beats kept repeating over and over. This would have been great as a 5-7 to seven minute short, but as is, it feels repetitive, overly long, and not on the level of the similar Where Is Everybody, which had its own issues, but they at least had a whole town square to play with. In King Nine Will Not Return, the mirages and minuscule clues only get this story so far. It may just be a modern sensibilities thing, but Robert Cummings' acting comes off as way over the top to me. It reminded me a little bit of Dewey Martin's performance in I Shot an Arrow Into the Air, where he's also driven mad in the desert, but for different reasons. <laughs> 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 to be fair, it's very difficult to pull off a role like this one believably. You have no one to bounce your dialogue off of, and you have to basically be confused for 20 minutes. Not easy, especially with the amount of dialogue Serling wrote for these kinds of characters. But it also didn't help that Embry called one of his crewmates Jimenez. Jimenez? Director Buzz Kulik admitted that that was his call because he wanted to make the character more believable. He said when serving in a war like World War II, people were brought in from all over the country, and to most Americans at the time, J-I-M was pronounced as Jim, so Jim Ennis. Kind of an odd thing to do, even back then, but whatever. The narrations helped for sure, but he still has a lot to say for a guy all alone in the desert. The visuals in this one aren't bad when they're given the chance to do something interesting. The shot showing one of Embry's crewmates in the cockpit of the plane is pretty creepy, even if they weren't able to exactly match the dissolve where he disappears. Overall, I just wasn't a big fan of this one. It dragged from the start, was overly explained at the end, and relied too much on the words spoken and not enough on the visuals needed to execute this kind of idea properly. I can see why some people would like it, but if I'm going back to rewatch the best of the series, King Nine Will Not Return would be far from my mind. But let's look forward to what else Season 2 has to offer us as we travel further into the Twilight Zone. The Man in the Bottle is far from a unique concept, but the execution of this genie story is pretty well done. It all relies on the performances of the three leads, and as was the case most of the time with this show, the acting is very high quality. Joseph Ruskin's deceptively menacing genie is the highlight for me personally, but one particular avenue that the story leads us down is a destination Rod Serling drove us to more than once in the Twilight Zone. 
Arthur Castle and his wife Edna own and operate a failing antique shop. They're massively behind on bills, but the kind-hearted Arthur still gives a few bucks to a struggling old woman named Mrs. Gumley for a wine bottle she admits she found in the trash. After arguing with his wife over their sinking business, Arthur accidentally knocks the wine bottle to the floor where smoke begins to pour out of it. The form of a well-dressed man then appears and says he's there to grant the castle's four wishes. After not believing him at first, the genie proves he's the real deal by fixing the broken glass in the front display case. With three wishes left, Arthur and Edna debate over what they need them for the most. Don Medford was back to direct his second episode after season one's A Passage for Trumpet. This installment doesn't have the heart of his first, but the script from Rod Serling served up a few opportunities to make it a distinct production with a few standout moments. Joseph Ruskin would say in a 2004 interview that he had ample time to rehearse, which led to the exceptional performances we were treated to. Ruskin's straightforward but sinister approach to the role has him come off as more of a devil-making-a-deal character than your typical genie, but that's what I like about it. The castle's second wish is for a million dollars in cash, and the genie complies. This is where we get the first hint that something inauspicious is afoot. <laughs> First of all, what a great idea to have all the money fall from the ceiling instead of it just appearing on the ground. Great call there. Raskin's laugh is terrifying. We hear it a couple times throughout the episode, and this guy had one heck of an evil guffaw. He worked for many years in film and TV, including providing his voice for a key moment in the Twilight Zone classic To Serve Man. We'll cover that one down the road, but everything from his sly smile to his laid-back and matter-of-fact delivery made this genie character hauntingly indelible. The castles are such good folks that they give away tens of thousands of dollars from their newly acquired cash to people from the neighborhood. But Uncle Sam wants his cut of that genie money. An agent from the IRS arrives and says Arthur and Edna have to pay over $940,000 in federal and state income taxes. After handing out what they gave to their friends, this leaves them with just $5. The genie then reappears and tells them to be mindful of their wishes because consequences still come along with them. Of course, they're not allowed to wish for more wishes, and once a wish is granted, it's permanent. Also, only a wish can undo another wish. I wish I didn't have to say wish so many times. No matter what you wish for, you must be prepared for the consequences. Arthur mulls it over for a while and, strangely, ends up wishing for power. He tells the genie to make him the leader of a contemporary foreign country where he can't be voted out of office. Edna agrees with him, and he gets what he asks for. I'm Hitler. I'm in a bunker. It's the end of the war. Now this is a Twilight Zone moment. The genie follows all of Arthur's instructions and turns him into Hitler just before his death. They even show the bottle of poison he's supposed to kill himself with. Luther Adler is great in this episode overall, and funnily enough, this wasn't the first time he played Hitler, but his reactions here elevate the sequence. It's horrifying, and also kind of hilarious. The twisted irony and build-up to the reveal made me feel several emotions simultaneously, which is why I think a scene like this exemplifies those shocking twists this series was known for. With his last wish, Arthur undoes the hellish situation he's been put in. The genie's bottle is smashed, and he arrives back in the antique shop. He and Edna clean the mess, throw out the shattered bottle, and go back to their lives with a greater sense of appreciation. The bottle then reforms in the garbage can as the story wraps up. I do like this episode, again, mostly for the performances and that big shock Hitler reveal. Sterling would use him as a character in another Twilight Zone episode in Season 4 that I am extremely excited to talk about when we get there. But as for the man in the bottle, I think it's good enough to recommend. It is a little inconsistent with Arthur's character, though. I'm not sure why he went from giving an old lady a couple bucks when he couldn't even pay his own bills and handing out all that wished cash to the neighborhood to yearning for power at the end. It could have been trying to say that having access to anything he wanted was corrupting him, or maybe the genie's magic was changing him from the inside out. There is a line that points to the latter. Edna, what's happening? What's going on? 
The genie says this is the normal pattern that's followed by his wishers, but it's not quite clear if it's human nature or magic that's changing our lead character. In terms of other miscellaneous notes, I thought it was a little odd that the castles are offered four wishes instead of three. I enjoyed the sample of Bernard Herrmann's walking distance score that they used at the beginning, and that's about it. You should check it out. I'd really like to read your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. In the end, it's a story that reminds us to be careful what you wish for when you're in the Twilight Zone. Nervous Man in a $4 Room contains quite possibly the best performance in a single Twilight Zone episode. Joe Mantel plays two versions of the same character, and he is absolutely incredible. William D. Gordon is the only other actor in the episode, and he's fantastic as well in his two short scenes, but Mantel just jumps out at the viewer with his dual portrayal. How he interacts with and plays off himself is phenomenal. A lot of the strength of that performance is due to the magnificently creative way director Douglas Hayes and cinematographer George T. Clemens shot this episode. Instead of the split screen that was suggested in the script by Serling, they used rear projection and timed camera movements and blocking to pull off Mantell's character trading lines with himself in real time. The effect still holds up. Rear projection is often noticeable in films and television shot around this time period. You can see that the mirror scenes look a little less clear than the rest of the footage, but that's forgotten instantly by the dynamic perspective motion and performances of this installment's lead actor. The fact that this whole episode takes place in one small room is a large part of the themes here, but it doesn't hinder what we're seeing at all. It actually enhances it. Jackie Rhodes is a small-time crook who works small-time jobs for a criminal contact of his named George. But for Jackie's newest job, George has upped the ante considerably. An old man who owns a local bar has been belligerent to George's organization, not paying protection money, kicking them out of his place, etc. Jackie is tasked with killing the old man at 2 a.m. that night. Since Rhodes isn't known to be a killer, George tells him he'll be able to slip out unnoticed with the deed done. Jackie reluctantly agrees, and soon after, he's confronted by his own reflection. This Jackie is strong, smart, and has an abundant amount of courage. He argues with himself about killing the old man, and brings up all the wrong choices he made in his past that led him to be a nervous man in a $4 room, ready to cross a line he can't come back from. While it was the third to air, this was actually the first episode that went into production for season two. It came in under budget because of the limited location and actors involved. This was done purposely by Serling to adhere to CBS's request to cut costs, as we mentioned before. It features one of Rod's more clever narrator appearances. We get a shot at the top of the room looking down on Jackie as Rod walks on screen upright, creating the illusion that he's walking on the walls. This shot was again achieved by using rear projection, just another innovative visual to add to this episode. They use this shot later, too, and it magnifies how Jackie is trapped in a situation he can't escape from. All his choices throughout his life have led him to where he is, and there's seemingly no way out. I really can't understate how great Joe Mantell is in both Jackie roles. Seeing him have a conversation with himself ranges from hopeful to sad and more, but it's always riveting stuff. I was zoned in to every word he said, every expression he made. I want to live with all the guts and goodness you left behind. I want to live the dreams you dreamed and never had the guts to live. Big fat chance. I'm me and you're you. You go out that door, you're finished. We're both finished. That's the door to nowhere. You got nothing. You got nothing but pain inside. Let me take over, Jackie. This is your last chance. It's really incredible how effortlessly he goes from coward to confident. While the underappreciated Joe Mantell is a real tour de force here, let's not forget how great William D. Gordon is in his limited screen time. George is intimidating and unpredictable. I love how he smiles to Jackie's face, but when Rhodes turns his back to him, he scowls with impatience. How George is shot drives home how imposing of a figure he is as well. I got no guts! Get up! Where you coming? Get guts, Jackie! I don't care where from! You get them under the bed, you buy them from a vendor, you grow them in a pot, I don't care, but you get them and you do the job. Both Mantell and Gordon show up in one more episode each. Mantell down the road in season five, and Gordon only a few episodes later. 
The legendary Jerry Goldsmith improves an already great production with a very strong musical score. How he embellishes both Jackie's personalities with appropriate melodies and cues complement the outstanding visuals with impressive audio on par with what we're watching. Eventually, Jackie gets so frustrated that he moves the mirror off the wall and spins it before leaving the room, but he's stopped by something that terrifies him. The Jackie in the mirror grows larger as we dissolve to George arriving. He reprimands Jackie for not doing the job, but when we see Jackie's face, he looks like a new man. In short order, he gives George what for and kicks him out of his room. Jackie, now referring to himself as John, then calls the front desk and tells them he's moving out. He looks to the mirror nearby and sees the original Jackie asking him what's next. Now we go look for a job. Now maybe we get married. Now maybe we stop biting our nails. I love, love, love this episode. It gets better with each viewing. One last moment of brilliance from Mantell showed us John had taken over before he had even said a word. That look of confident defiance said it all. And I love how this ends on such a positive note. Usually with these kinds of stories, the roles would be reversed, where the undesirable or evil version of the main character ends the narrative on the outside while the innocent original is trapped. But in this case, Jackie finally stands up for himself and pledges to live a better life. It ends on a feel-good note, and I enjoyed that greatly. A similar concept was done in Season 5's The Last Night of a Jockey starring Mickey Rooney, and while I'll admit I've only seen a small number of episodes from the 1980s reboot at this point, I did see the comparable Shatter Day, where Bruce Willis goes through something like this as well. Neither of those episodes come close to how great Nervous Man in a $4 Room is. It's one of the best performance-driven installments of the entire show, and it's one you need to see to understand its brilliance. In my opinion, Douglas Hayes was 4 out of 5 helming his first handful of episodes of The Twilight Zone. With the exception of The Chaser, he was in charge of some top-tier productions, and he was far from finished. In fact, we'll discuss a couple more of his episodes very, very soon. Until then, make sure you seek this one out and give it a view. I'll leave you with Rod Serling's original narration that wasn't used in the episode, but I actually like it a little better. Exit Mr. John, nay, Jackie Rhodes, age 34 about to carve himself a nicer and more acceptable piece of life. And while we do not offer this story as the norm or the rule, there is a school of thought that says that there are two people in each of us. So gentlemen, mind who you're shaving tomorrow. If you nick yourself and the mirror yells, ouch, you've arrived in the twilight zone. A Thing About Machines has some interesting visuals and a pretty thrilling climax. While it's not a great episode, the concept of machines coming to life can be a scary one. I mean, look at the world we're living in now. But in 1960, seeing a television talk to you or a typewriter type on its own could be understandably creepy. Even this guy's car comes to life, which is an idea used to its full potential a few seasons later. Quick weird tangent here, but this episode reminded me of a particular TV episode from sometime in the 90s. I want to say it was Unsolved Mysteries, but I couldn't find it listed anywhere. Might have been another similar type show, but it depicted what would happen on December 21st, 2012. For those who need a refresher, that was the date the Mayan calendar ended, which many perceived to be the end of the world. It showed how our supposed downfall was going to be technology. Let's be honest, that sentiment is absolutely correct, but how they visualized it here was so odd. Blenders were coming to life to shred up arms in a bloody display. I think vacuums were consuming humans and more strange stuff like that. The image of the woman's bloody arm trapped in a blender as she screamed to escape has always stuck with me. Whenever I saw the 2012 end of the world thing brought up, that's what my mind always went to. And it loosely ties into the theme of this story, but I really just wanted to see if anyone else remembers this weird ass episode of whatever it was. But regardless, back to the Twilight Zone. Bartlett Finchley is an ornery, rich snob who constantly breaks his electronic appliances located throughout his large mansion-esque home. 
After verbally sparring with his regular repairman, we start to see why Finchley has such a deep-seated hatred for machines. They come to life when he's alone and torment him by keeping the well-off food critic awake at night, constantly making noise, or in some cases, telling him to leave his house. Things escalate when after a night of drinking, they all come to life at once with the goal of getting rid of Finchley, or perhaps driving him mad. This episode was another of Rod's scripts and directed by David Ork McDiarmid. McDiarmid directed the offbeat time travel episode Execution from season one and would return later in season two with his final episode Back There, another time travel installment that we'll be covering here very soon. A small note I wanted to mention is how much I really liked Serling's on-screen appearance in this one. Popping up on the TV that's a big part of the overall plot was very clever and it doesn't take away at all from him not being on set in person. It's been said that Rod Serling identified heavily with the blue-collar working man and often painted them in a positive light inside many of his stories. On the other side of that coin, there wasn't much love lost for those who lived more extravagant lifestyles, especially if they acted in a manner similar to Bartlett Finchley. Portrayed by the prolific Richard Hade, he's uppity, rude, insulting, and has an innate sense of superiority when speaking to the few people he interacts with. The difference between the classes is shown right away with the TV repairman, played by Barney Phillips in the second of his four appearances, as they go back and forth on how Bartlett's TV set has been intentionally broken more than once. Last time I was over here, you'd kick your foot through the screen, remember? The set was not working properly. I tried to get it to do so in a perfectly normal fashion. Why didn't you just horsewhip it, Mr. Finchley? That had showed who's boss. Later, Finchley trades barbs with his typist, Mrs. Rogers. She's shown having enough of his insults and quits. But this is where we see Bartlett show a bit of humanity, admitting he doesn't want to be left alone and asking Rogers to stay. After he confesses his paranormal problem of the machines in his home coming to life, Mrs. Rogers suggests he see a doctor, a suggestion he throws back in her face before kicking her out. That was the only glimpse behind the arrogant facade that Finchley created for himself. From then on, things intensify. His typewriter types up a message for him to get out, a dancing woman on his television talks directly to him with the same thought, and even his unplugged phone follows suit. Finchley's electronic razor also comes to life with a more threatening attitude. Eventually, he's forced out, but Bartlett's car then comes to life and chases him all over the property until he's knocked into his pool and drowns. The episode finishes on a puzzled police officer and coroner speculating how his life ended. This climactic chase scene is more action-packed than most Twilight Zone finales and it's executed well. One could say it's even quaint how they make the car crash into dozens of stacked boxes conveniently outside of Finchley's home. Who doesn't love that old trope? I'm on the fence about recommending this one though. While A Thing About Machines isn't a top-notch episode, it still has a few decent scenes, that car chase being the highlight. If you're looking for an all-around solid installment, this isn't it, but it makes for a passable trip into the Twilight Zone. You! You machines! There is a lot to say about The Howling Man. They had the best of the best behind the scenes bringing this one to life. Of course, I'm talking about writer Charles Beaumont and director Douglas Hayes. The last time these two teamed up was in one of my favorite episodes from season one, that being Elegy. Hayes continued to knock his installments out of the park following the after hours and the brilliant, nervous man in a $4 room from earlier in the second season. This was the fifth episode written by Beaumont overall and the first to air in season two. An ominous tone, excellent visuals, fantastic performances, and a chilling message make The Howling Man not only memorable, but probably one of the best constructed episodes of all 156 original Twilight Zone installments. The story follows a man named David Ellington during post-World War I Europe. He's wandering in the middle of an intense storm after losing his way on a walking trip. Ellington pounds on a large monastery door looking for shelter. After some convincing, he's allowed to enter what's referred to as the Hermitage, where members of a mysterious religious order all reside. Ellington passes out from sickness and later, after hearing strange howling sounds, discovers that the order has a man imprisoned. The man pleads with Ellington to let him out and calls the brothers in the Hermitage religious fanatics. 
The leader of the group, Brother Jerome, eventually explains to David that the man imprisoned is the devil himself. The only thing keeping him from escaping is Jerome's staff of truth. He warns Ellington to not listen to the man in the cell and to stay away from him at all costs. David is left to wonder who is really telling the truth. Based on Beaumont's short story, The Howling Man went through several changes from print to screen. Beaumont changed several aspects of the original tale when writing his teleplay, but Douglas Hayes made a few more significant changes of his own, which we'll get to in the twist section. They mostly have to do with the visuals of this episode, an aspect that were absolutely striking and delivered powerfully by the famously image-driven director. Canted, or Dutch angles as they're known, are used often in this episode. From the first frame all the way up through nearly the end, they're shown with purpose, suggesting an eerie feeling or more practically, mirroring the illness that our main character is experiencing. When David first enters the hermitage, he's sick from being out in the storm. His wooziness leads to a fall that the camera matches with a tilt, mimicking vertigo. As always, a lot of the credit goes to cinematographer George T. Clemens for pulling off these camera movements. He and Douglas Hayes went all out to separate the look of this installment from most of the pack. Let's talk about the performances next, because they're just as important to the story as everything else. H. M. Winant plays Ellington very theatrically. With how the script is written and the other characters and actors involved, this wasn't out of step with the episode, but I think he's by far the weakest of the cast. There's something about his delivery and expressions that could have been reined in a bit. In contrast, the legendary John Carradine nails his over-the-top portrayal of the Moses-like brother Jerome. Pretty much every second he's on screen is a joy. What you saw is not a man. It is the devil himself. He's the devil. How do you keep him locked up? With the staff for truth. The one barrier he cannot pass. In the short story and teleplay, the staff of truth was actually a cross, but Douglas Hayes suggested changing it to avoid offending Christian groups who may see the show. Beaumont was against the change, but the staff of truth prevailed. The scenes with Robin Hughes as the Howling Man are genuinely engaging. His exchanges with Ellington make us question what's really going on. Speaking of which, this is an episode you should see for yourself before hearing my thoughts on the ending. It's definitely a recommendation for me, and I think just about everyone can find some attribute to like here, even if you're not a fan of the full piece. So again, go ahead and give it a watch if you've never seen it. Ultimately, Ellington chooses to believe the man locked up in the cell. David steals the key to the room he's locked in with Brother Christophorus and quietly walks to the Howling Man. He removes the Staff of Truth blocking the cell door and frees the prisoner. The man slowly transforms into the actual devil and disappears in a puff of smoke. Brother Jerome then comforts the shocked Ellington. I saw him and didn't recognize him. That is man's weakness and Satan's strength. From there, we dissolve to an older David who's been telling this story to his housekeeper. After decades of searching, he's trapped the devil himself and holds him in a room with a miniature staff of truth. He goes out to start the process of returning him to Brother Jerome and reiterates to the housekeeper to not open the door. Of course, as soon as he leaves, she removes the staff and the door slowly opens, ending the story. Charles Beaumont's Twilight Zone episodes always have a heavy sense of dread attached to them, and this may be the heaviest he wrote for the series. The themes of man being fooled and releasing the ultimate evil into the world doesn't have to be taken literally. You can view it through the lens of giving in to the temptation of distrusting each other, which leads to an infinity of escalating conflicts. Or I'm sure there are other interpretations out there that I'm not thinking of. Either way, I really liked The Howling Man. The titular character's transformation into the devil is impressive to say the least. The first lighting shift uses the same technique from season one's long live Walter Jameson, and it's just as effective here. Going from red to green light reveals the red colored makeup on the actor's face, or it might be green light to red with green makeup here, but anyway, it's an effect that still holds up and is a practical way to show off a quick metamorphosis. But they weren't done there. In another practical effect, Hayes borrowed from 1935's Werewolf in London, and we see the transformation continue from pillar to pillar until Hughes was in the full devil getup. They achieved this by taking the same camera movement on all five makeup stages. It's not seamless, but it was a really unique way to complete the conversion to full-on embodiment of evil. <laughs> The 
that music there really lifted the moment too. Supposedly, it's an unused theme for the Twilight Zone opening. It fits in perfectly here, building on the demonic transformation we're seeing. This reveal was another point of contention between Beaumont and Hayes. In the original short story, the devil is never seen at all. It's heavily implied that the Howling Man was who Brother Jerome claimed him to be, but some of it is left up to the imagination. In Beaumont's teleplay, he went a step further to have Ellington grab the character's foot as he escapes, only to find out it was a cloven hoof he was touching. With Hayes being such a visual director, he felt strongly that they needed a bigger payoff, and we got what we got. It was another big change Beaumont was against, but Hayes had the final say. While the makeup transitions are pretty outstanding, having the devil look so stereotypically devilish feels like a little much. The show used this character in a handful of stories, but he's always shown in an unconventional way. This depiction kind of went against that, but I can't complain too much. While a more subtle reveal would have worked, this one still made for a well-executed, memorable moment. The ending with the door opening is creepy and appropriate, but the original short story finished on Ellington being told that the brothers had recaptured the Howling Man. An uncharacteristically positive wrap-up for a more well-known Beaumont story. As for the episode, you should check it out again if you already have. If you've never seen it and know the twist now, it's still worth watching for the exceptional production aspects and performances. Ancient folks saying, you can catch the devil, but you can't hold him long in the Twilight Zone. There is so much information available about Eye of the Beholder. Everything from cast interviews to details about the makeup process and more are widely accessible to anyone with an internet connection. On the Blu-ray, there are four commentary tracks and a 25-minute interview segment for this episode alone. It's no wonder, I suppose, because this installment of the show is one of the most well-known. It's up there with Time Enough at Last, The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, Nightmare 20,000 Feet, and a few others that are recognizable one way or another to people who've never even heard of The Twilight Zone. And that attention is warranted. It without a doubt holds up to a modern critical eye and deserves its status among the best this series has to offer. But how and why does Eye of the Beholder endure? There are a plethora of reasons. Let us count them. Janet Tyler has just undergone her 11th procedure to fix her facial deformity. It's the last one allowed by the state before she'll be dealt with in a way that doesn't offend normal people who are repulsed by her appearance. Tyler's face is covered by bandages since her latest procedure, and the day has finally come to remove them. The medical team trying to help her talk amongst themselves about how sorry they feel for the woman, with her doctor especially feeling saddened by her ordeal. Just before the bandages are cut off, the leader of the state begins an address to the nation about what he calls glorious conformity. As the gauze coverings are cut into and unwrapped, the medical staff waits in anxious anticipation to see if their work has proven successful. This episode is known by another name, which makes it a bit of a rarity in that way. Eye of the Beholder was the original title, and on its first airing, that's what it was called. But Rod Serling was threatened with a lawsuit soon after, and hoping to avoid any legal problems, he changed it to the private world of darkness when it was rebroadcast. On the Blu-ray set, the episode plays with its original name over the end credits, but it seems an original print of that version wasn't found because it's in a lower quality than the rest of the fully restored HD footage. Interestingly, the alternate title appears in an extra feature where the end credits have been fully restored in HD. It seems that version of the episode was more widely available. Eye of the Beholder is what this episode is more known as though, and I think most people would say the better, slightly more appropriate title. Douglas Hayes continued his streak of iconic Twilight Zone directorial work with his favorite episode here. This aired right after the previous week's The Howling Man, which also saw Hayes at the helm. Eye of the Beholder made him 4 for 4 in the second season, and he still had two more installments to go. He put his signature stamp on this one with more outstanding visuals and a delicate way of approaching the story. In Serling's original script, the medical staff were written as unsympathetic to Janet Tyler's situation. In a stroke of brilliance that gave some pitch-perfect nuance to this episode, Hayes changed that to where they did feel sorry for the main character. They weren't acting callously toward her at all, even having the doctor take this case personally. Yes, they were working for the state, but they were shown to have authentic empathy for Tyler. 
Speaking of the Doctor, he's played wonderfully by William D. Gordon. You may remember that name from our review of Nervous Man in a $4 Room. Douglas Hayes worked with Gordon in that episode as well, so it was only natural to bring him back here. Gordon played a very different character in this story, and he really nailed it. Since he's in shadow for most of the episode, he had to rely on his vocal inflections and body language to get across all his emotion. Why shouldn't people be allowed to be different? Why? Doctor, be careful. I know, treason. The same can be said for Maxine Stewart, who was one of two actresses who played Janet Taylor. Hayes cast her mostly for her voice, which was meant to throw the audience off, but she really impressed me with how believably she portrayed the character without the use of her face. The state is not God. It hasn't the right to penalize somebody for an accident of birth. It hasn't the right to make ugliness a crime. In fact, the only face we do see in full detail until the 19 minute mark is that of Rod Serling. The way he entered here was fantastic. It wasn't just the usual stepping into frame. We see his silhouette appear behind a facade as he moves like a ghost to face the camera and speak to us. It's creepy and an appropriate way to introduce him in a story like this one. The lighting and overall look of this episode was deliberately meticulous. Since we saw no one's face for a great while, any dialogue had to be shown creatively. This kept the actors in heavy shadow with precise blocking for when and where they moved. Hayes and cinematographer George T. Clemens also kept the camera moving, so we didn't get too close to seeing these characters' expressions. The cinematography never looked static or dull. When the bandages were being taken off Janet, the camera was placed under them, so we get a first-person view of Tyler emerging from her interior darkness. This was achieved by wrapping up a fishbowl for the camera to look through, and it turned out pretty great. The hospital rooms and hallway sets also create a sense of space that added to Eye of the Beholder's trademark appearance. The music was handled this time around by the legendary Bernard Herrmann. Herman was prolific in his day, composing the music in movies from Citizen Kane to Taxi Driver. In addition to the original Twilight Zone theme, he scored three episodes prior to this one, including the iconic Walking Distance. That one had music so good, they reused elements from it a whole bunch of times throughout the series. It was a regular occurrence to reuse music back then, as CBS had their library to draw from. But for Eye of the Beholder, Herman was hired to create something original. There's only about nine minutes of composition, but it's used when it needs to be heard, which helped the episode feel even more special. Herman would go on to later score three more installments of the series. Another huge aspect of this production was William Tuttle's makeup, but we can only discuss that after the twist section. If by some miracle you've never seen any of the images from this episode and have yet to sit down and watch it, you should do it. The twist is one of the biggest in the show's history, and you'll want to see it for yourself if it hasn't already been spoiled for you. The doctor fully removes Janet's bandages and remarks that the procedure didn't work. We're finally shown the face of Tyler, and it's that of a beautiful woman. The lights are then turned on, and we see that everyone else has what we would consider to be deformed faces. Not wanting to live this way, Janet runs out into the hallway as the leader of the state continues his speech on conformity across the TV screens. She runs into a room with someone who, by our standards, looks to be a handsome young man. The doctor then enters to explain that the man is named Walter Smith. He's a representative of the community she'll be moving to, a community entirely made up of people of her kind. Smith comforts her and assures her she'll live a happy life there. They calmly walk off together as the medical staff all look on with pity, ending this trip into the Twilight Zone. William Tuttle did makeup effects for about a dozen episodes here. His work usually stands out, contributing to the look of whatever production he's involved in. In this case, Douglas Hayes wanted a pig-type appearance for these characters. To save money, Hayes saw Tuttle's Morlock designs from the 1960 film version of The Time Machine and asked to modify some of them for the characters in this world. The finished pieces are minimal with just a few exaggerated features glued onto each actor's face. The additional darkening under the eyes helped them come off as appropriately twisted. Supposedly, CBS was concerned it might be a bit too shocking for viewers. Conversely, Janet Revealed is played by Donna Douglas. Best known for the Beverly Hillbillies, Douglas plays her role well here. Initially, they had Maxine Stewart dub in her lines, but Douglas was able to match Stewart's deeper tone and her own voice was kept in the few lines she spoke. 
It was Hayes' idea to split the part for two actresses. He hoped to throw the audience off with the voice of an older woman before unmasking Douglas. It ended up being a pretty effective move. The big reveal of what these characters look like was classic Twilight Zone. Dramatic music, quick cutting, and a sense of panic spurred on the moment. Of course, Janet is terrified for a whole different reason than one would think if seeing this episode in a bubble. She considers herself to be a deformed monster and rushes out into the hallway with that super creepy telecast of the leader screaming his warped ideals of conformity. It's a phenomenal sequence. Serling and this show in general often use the tactic of something like the state forcing its narrow-minded will on the citizens of its society as a metaphor for real-world injustice. Totalitarianism and dictators were never far from Serling's work. This episode might be the greatest and most striking instance of that. Singling out a certain group and having a nation conform to one sole way of thinking are not occurrences that only happen in faraway lands. But that's not the only message Serling put into this story. It all comes back around to beauty truly being in the eye of the beholder. It's memorable, it looks amazing, it's acted very well, and the story bursts through the screen in a dramatic example of its moral. There's even more information on this classic out there, so if you're interested, take a look and discover additional details about the story and production. Regardless, this is required viewing when diving into the best of the Twilight Zone. Nick of Time is the Twilight Zone at its minimalistic best. Nearly the whole episode takes place in a little diner's booth, focusing on the interaction between the two main characters. Of course, in this show, there's a third party causing a disturbance. Don and Pat Carter are newlyweds on their honeymoon trip to New York City. However, their car has broken down in the small town of Ridgeview, Ohio. While they wait for it to be fixed, the couple gets some food at the local diner, where a penny fortune teller machine sits inside their booth. Don slowly becomes obsessed with its answers after the machine correctly predicts his new promotion. Pat and her husband argue about what to do next when it's implied they shouldn't leave Ridgeview. Choice, superstition, and coincidence collide in this small-scale story. The most obvious thing to point out about this episode is the first appearance of one William Shatner. This was a few years before Star Trek and his more well-known episode, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. He's great in this role and doesn't have too many Shatnerisms that he became known for later, but there are a few. Are we going to live in the East? Are we going to live in the West? Are you just going to stay here? I don't know. His chemistry with Patricia Breslin is really strong here. They're a believable couple going through their first big conflict, as the Pat character is seeing glimpses of Don's intense superstition, to the point where she starts to question the man she just married, going from believing in him wholeheartedly to having a crisis of confidence across the story. After a few more of the machine's quasi-predictions seem to come true, such as a car almost hitting them in the street outside, she pleads with Don to listen to reason. When that car almost hit us, it was 3 o'clock. Exactly when that machine said it. You said three o'clock, not the machine. You decided to sit in here as long as we did. You. Can't you see that you made up all the details and all that, that that thing did was give back generalities? I can't play that whole scene, but it's very naturally acted by these two and worth seeing for yourself. They have a genuine quality with each other that makes them convincing in their loving but also bickering moments. Nick of Time was written by Richard Matheson in his first of only two episodes penned for the second season. It was inspired by his own experience of traveling with his wife and finding a similar fortune teller machine in the booth of a diner. Matheson would get Shatner back as his lead in another script he wrote, that being down the road in the previously mentioned season 5 classic, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Richard L. Baer returned to direct this episode, and it was the second time he helmed a script inspired by one of Matheson's stories. Back in season one, he directed Third from the Sun, which was written by Serling, but adapted from Matheson's short story of the same name. While that episode dealt more with tension, atmosphere, and foreboding visuals, Nick of Time was a much smaller in scope tale that focused on the dialogue between the two main characters. Tension is still present, but its deceptively simple cinematography and setting seemed to intentionally highlight the broader discussion of ideologies being debated. 
After being so engrossed with the machine and its vague answers for quite a while, Don finally listens to his wife's appeal that they should live life by one's own choices. It doesn't matter whether it can foretell the future. What matters is whether you believe more in, in luck and in fortune than you do in yourself. We can have a, a wonderful life together if we make it wonderful ourselves. Inspired by his wife's words, Don gains the courage to step back out into the world with Pat by his side. They resolve their first big lover's quarrel and leave the diner just as another couple enters. Looking worn down and haggard, they approach the same fortune teller machine and begin asking it more questions. They're obviously slaves to the answers and have been in Ridgeview for quite some time. The episode ends on their desperate expressions of despair. I really enjoyed this episode and the moral of the story. Dwelling on what could or might happen should never hold one back from living their lives to the fullest. It's not quite a blanket sentiment because of course there are nuances to consider in every case, but the general statement I got from this episode was a powerful one. Make your own life as happy as possible. Some of us have more obstacles to overcome than others, and this is all much easier said than done. But trying to keep that mindset is important to me personally, so I connected with it in a big way. It's left ambiguous whether or not the fortune-telling machine was really predicting the future, but I love how the Pat character says it doesn't matter. That's what I took away from this one, and it's definitely a recommendation. Check it out if you haven't, and if you have, tell me what you thought of the overall message in the comments below. Or don't, it's your choice to make, whether you're in or out of the Twilight Zone. The Lateness of the Hour was the first of six episodes shot on videotape instead of film in an attempt to cut costs. As I mentioned earlier in these reviews, while The Twilight Zone was getting a lot of recognition from critics and audiences, CBS had an issue with how much each episode was going over budget. Rod Serling took these concerns into consideration when crafting the stories by keeping the cast and locations to a minimum. But even that wasn't enough, and the experiment of shooting on videotape was implemented in the middle of this second season. Of course, these were aired out of order and staggered across late 1960 into 61, but six productions in a row were all recorded on tape for a jarringly different look. Not all of the episodes shot on video were bad, but with the lateness of the hour being the first attempt, the quality dip was noticeable in more than one aspect of production. Dr. Lauren and his wife live with their daughter Jana in a secluded house. The doctor has surrounded his family with robots that he built who serve them as maids, butlers, etc. These very human-like machines meet their every need, which has resulted in Dr. and Mrs. Lauren becoming so dependent on them that they have isolated themselves from the outside world, never leaving or wanting for anything. Jana has seen the effect these robots have had on her parents and starts to question why they never venture outside or at least why Jana herself isn't allowed to leave the property. She demands that her father dismantle the robots, but when he refuses, Jana threatens to leave. The Lawrence plead with their daughter that no one in the outside world can care for her and that she must remain with her loving parents. But when Jana brings up the prospect of living a full, natural life and giving them grandchildren, she starts to pick up on the fact that her parents have been hiding something. Jack Smite returned to direct this episode after his season one classic, The Lonely. He helmed four episodes in total, with this one here and his final two being among the videotaped installments. I'm sure that was limiting for him, since he made such great use of the Death Valley location for his season one production. But there is at least one more in the bunch that's still remembered quite fondly, and we'll get to that later this month. But the lateness of the hour does not meet that quality standard. In addition to Smite, most of the actors involved in this episode made other Twilight Zone appearances. This includes Mary Gregory, Doris Carnes, Jason Johnson, Irene Tedrow, and the well-known John Hoyt. The most prominent, though, is this story's lead, Inger Stevens. She very memorably appeared in one of the most haunting installments this show ever gave us in The Hitchhiker. Her portrayal of Nan Adams is one of the more indelible performances for a protagonist in the series. It's extremely unfortunate that, along with just about everything else in this episode, she doesn't come off well. It goes without saying that the tape recording of this episode makes it look cheap, especially when comparing it to episodes immediately before and after. But as a result of how this was produced, all the performances come across as overtly theatrical. The blocking is very clumsy too, and even Rod himself comes off awkward. The residence of Dr. William Moran. 
which is in reality a menagerie for machines. Since this had a more live performance feel and I'm sure limited time with a smaller budget, Serling opted to read off cue cards which really throws off the mystique of his on-screen presence. I'm sure he did this other times, but it's patently obvious here and pulled me out of an already unusual episode. After at first refusing, Dr. Loren gives in to his daughter's demands and dismantles his creations in hopes of keeping Janna home. Happy with her father's decision, Janna exclaims how free they can be now. She mentions meeting a man and eventually having children of her own, but the doctor and his wife start acting very strangely. Janna runs to the photo album and can't find a picture of herself as a little girl. A sense of dread fills her being as she figures out the shocking truth. You made me. You built me. You manufactured me. You built a daughter! Janna is another one of Lauren's robotic creations. He and his wife were childless, and thus they made Janna to fill that void. They do seem to truly love her like an offspring, but Janna is broken by this news. All of her memories were implanted by the doctor. Everything from childhood to the present. She can't accept this and is beside herself. I'm a thing! I'm a machine! A machine! We cut to later where Mrs. Lauren is being massaged by her maid, as in the beginning of the episode. However... Of course, Mrs. Lauren. Of course. That reveal with the unsettling musical cue is still a shocking moment to me. Rod pulled off a double twist. The first is Janna discovering she's not human, but the twist of the knife for the audience is seeing that Dr. Lauren reprogrammed her as a maid to serve him and his wife. It's made so much worse by the Laurens reassuring Janna how much they truly loved her as a daughter just before that scene. This moment was very well foreshadowed in the opening sequence where Mrs. Lauren is incessantly moaning from her massage by Nelda, one of the original maids. It was to the point where Janna called her out on how obnoxious it was. Oh. Don't make her do that anymore! What is the matter with you? Those constant animal grunts of pleasure! They even renamed Janna Nelda in the final scene. In short, it's effed up! We rarely saw a character like Janna given such a horrifying ending in a Serling script, but maybe he set her up as not that great of a person by wanting the other robots dismantled. Dr. Lauren initially refuses because doing so would extinguish what he considers life. There is a scene where the original robots argue and plead with Lauren about not being destroyed. I think you'll agree I with me. I came very well recommended, sir. There is no more efficient maid in the entire country. I can country. fix anything that has to be fixed. And, and I've well, I, I can no fix more. anything. <laughs> Robert, you have your orders. Janna also threw one of the robots down the stairs and took pleasure in their destruction after Lauren agrees to dismantle them. All of you, rest in peace. Even with all that, I don't think this character deserved the fate that she was stuck with. Finding out she was a robot all along was enough. Reprogramming her to be something that she hated after her parents claimed to truly love her was excessively cruel in my opinion. But outside of the video look, it's the only memorable aspect to this story. Despite, or maybe because of all my problems with it, I'm actually going to recommend this episode. I want to hear what you guys think in the comments, so let me know your opinion on the lateness of the hour. Is it notable enough for a full discussion, or should we leave it and its grim double twist in the Twilight Zone? The Trouble with Templeton is another episode that focuses on nostalgia. It's a longing for the past that the main character feels, and as usual, he's met with an unexpected reality when he visits those bygone days. It's a theme we have seen done superbly well in episodes like Walking Distance and a handful of others. The unique thing about this one is that it wasn't written by Rod Serling or any of the usual writing staff. E. Jack Newman was a prolific television writer at the time and had a long career after this. He was a friend of producer Buck Houghton, and while it's his only credit on the series, Newman came up with a story that he wrote in a single day that fit right in with the softer side of the Twilight Zone. Veteran stage actor Booth Templeton lives the life of an aging star. His much younger wife flaunts her affairs right in front of him as he takes hourly medication and often thinks of his first wife, who died decades ago at just 25 years old. 
He's brought to a theater on the first day of rehearsal for his new play when he finds out the producer of the show has switched directors. The new man in charge is named Arthur Willis, and he's more autocratic than auteur. After chewing out Templeton for being late, Booth rushes out of the theater to find himself transported back to the year 1927. He's well known by the people he sees since he was a young rising star in those days. Templeton is told by an old friend of his from back then that his wife is waiting for him at a local speakeasy. Incredulous, he goes to meet her. You can tell that there was some real fondness for the material by the people who made this episode. This was Buzz Kulik's second of the nine episodes he directed, so you'll be hearing his name a lot more in these videos as we go along. Kulik called The Trouble with Templeton one of his favorite pieces he ever directed, and star Brian Ahern was said to be just as moved by the story. Apparently, he was also convinced to star in it after seeing an episode of The Twilight Zone. With that knowledge and understanding the tone of the show, the second time he read the script made it all click. Another recognizable face is that of well-known director Sidney Pollack. Pollock acted quite a bit throughout his career, and his portrayal of the authoritarian stage director Arthur Willis was said by Buzz Kulik to be based on a real director from New York that neither of them liked working with. The character's southern accent was the main attribute pulled from this mutual acquaintance. The last two are related and dependent upon the first, therefore the first day of rehearsal is an extremely important day. This kind of story had definitely been done better on this show, but there is an authenticity to the trouble with Templeton that makes it very watchable and sympathetic. Brian Ahern's sophisticated yet yearning performance draws us in, as we're rooting for Booth after the story about his first wife. There are some moments in life that have an indescribable loveliness to them. Those moments with Laura are all I have left now. When Templeton enters the speakeasy in 1927, it's a real visual achievement. Actually, everything from here on out is pretty top-notch. Love that moment. The atmosphere in there really made this time period come to life on screen. They didn't really need an explanation for why everyone recognizes Booth even though he's over 30 years older, but they do give us one. Everybody thinks he's still wearing his old man makeup from the play he just got out of that night. From here, he finally tracks down his dearly departed wife Laura, in addition to his best friend Barney, who's also passed away. When interacting with Laura, he sees that she's not at all how he remembers her. She's rude and dismissive of him. Laura repeats that she doesn't want to talk to Templeton, she just wants to have a good time. Booth is troubled by her temperament not matching the woman he knew. Why don't you go back where you came from? We don't want you here. I just want to say, that was a good slap. I may have seen better, but the sound effect, combined with how genuinely unexpected it was, captured my attention. Following this, Booth leaves the bar heartbroken as Laura continues to dance. But that's when another unexpected happening occurs. <laughs> That was all done in one take, and it's startling, but visually comprehensible when it comes to the story. Pippa Scott's, great name by the way, expression there says everything needed. I love how the lights fade to spotlight her before going all the way off. Very well done visual storytelling. Booth returns to the theater in present day, and takes out a script Laura was fanning herself with at the bar. It reads, what to do when Booth comes back. The scene inside is exactly how his interaction with her and Barney played out. They were acting so he wouldn't stay in the past and move on with his life in the future. With a new pep in his step, Booth takes charge and confidently enters the rehearsal, telling the younger director that he'll show him some respect before requesting that the producer leave so he can get to work with the cast. The episode ends on Booth's reinvigorated outlook on life. There's more to like about The Trouble with Templeton than just a well-executed nostalgia story. It has good performances and a pair of great visual moments. Also, I'm usually just a sucker for scripts like this when they're done the right way, and this one was, so of course it fits into my recommendation category. If there's one thing I didn't love, it was Booth over-explaining everything at the end, but that's all a small complaint. Check this one out, and let it take you to where 1960 and 1927 took up the same space at the same time only in The Twilight Zone.
A most unusual camera is one of the most Rod Serlingist titles across this series. I can't read it without hearing his voice. The premise is an intriguing one, but is it worth rewatching? Chester and Paula Diedrich are a pair of thieves who just robbed a curio shop. As they rummage through their worthless hall, Chester discovers an old camera. He tries taking a picture of his wife, but it doesn't immediately develop. After a minute or so, it does spit out a picture, but not exactly the one he took. His wife is wearing a fur coat that she wasn't wearing when the photo was snapped. Soon after, they discover a fur coat hidden in one of the chests they stole. Paula excitedly puts it on and poses for Chester. Diedrich looks back at the picture and discovers that it's the same fur coat and pose. Later, Paula takes a picture of the door to prove it was some kind of fluke, but when the photo develops, it shows her currently jailed brother Woodward standing in the doorway. Moments later, Woodward appears. He broke out of prison and is filled in on the situation. The trio decide to take the camera to a horse racing track to win some money, and from there, a few more surprises await. This is one of the simpler stories that I've rewatched thus far, and that's not a knock. A ton of phenomenal Twilight Zone episodes are simple stories, but with the fertile premise this one had, I feel like they didn't do enough with it. I'm not saying something bigger like the fate of the world had to be on the line or anything, I'm just saying the emotional stakes felt very low throughout the duration of the episode. With another story surrounding it, this concept could have said a lot more. In fact, this episode did inspire the Goosebumps book Say Cheese and Die and its sequel, Say Cheese and Die Again. They were both adapted into Goosebumps TV episodes, and while they aren't high art, I at least remember the first one being lively and interesting enough, using the premise to a much more satisfying degree. A most unusual camera isn't terrible, though. Fred Clark plays Chester Diedrich with a very natural delivery. He's believable as a small-time crook who's annoyed by having to team up with his wife and brother-in-law. There are a few funny moments achieved by what he brought to the role. Here, world. A gift from Chester Diedrich and his wife. Don't forget Woodward. Yeah, and you too, Woodward. By the way, there's this weird echo in that scene on the Blu-ray. Listen if you can hear it. Here, world. Here, world. I don't think that was supposed to be there. You can watch the episode with the original or remastered audio on the Blu-ray set, and it's on both of them, so it must have been some kind of mistake made in the original mix. Just an odd thing that I noticed. I recognize the Woodward actor, Adam Williams, from his previous Twilight Zone appearance in The Hitchhiker. He played the sailor Nan picks up and is very memorable in that small part. Here, he's playing the dumb brother stereotype, but he's not bad as the comic relief in an already comedy-heavy episode. It just felt like the cast was spinning their wheels a bit since the story didn't go anywhere overly stimulating. Director John Rich kept things pretty basic in the one set used for the majority of the episode. He came back one more time to helm season 5's A Kind of Stopwatch. Rich is known best for directing 81 episodes of All in the Family and 41 episodes of the original Dick Van Dyke Show. After using the camera to win thousands of dollars at the racetrack, a French waiter enters the room to read the inscription on the front of the device. This à la propriétaire. That means 10 to an owner. Well, I presume that means you may only take 10. With only two pictures left, the trio argue about how to use them when the camera snaps off another photograph. This time, it's of Paula looking shocked. Chester and Woodward think the look on her face means the other is killing them in front of her, so they tussle until they both fall out of the open window and perish below. After a moment of mourning, Paula realizes she's left with the money and uses the last picture to take a photo of the dead bodies for... posterity. The waiter then re-enters to reveal he knows they were thieves, and with Chester and Woodward out of the way, he begins robbing Paula. When he picks up the camera, he sees that the picture shows more than two bodies on the ground outside. Paula goes to check, trips, and falls to her death. The waiter then notices there are four bodies in the picture and drops the camera as a yell is heard in the background. We're left to assume that he was the fourth corpse. The ending of this episode is uncharacteristically clunky. The waiter only notices there are four bodies after Paula falls. The men immediately start fighting to the death because of an extremely ambiguous picture. It felt like Serling just wanted them all out of that window fast, and it ended up seeming like a rush job to get them there. Did the waiter jump to his death? His yell and how that last sequence is paced feels more like a Three Stooges short than a Twilight Zone episode. One, two, three. Four. 
Skip this one. It's not the worst episode of the show, but it's dull, clunky, and wastes a good premise. Maybe all four characters fell out of that window and into a better area of the Twilight Zone. The Night of the Meek is widely considered to be one of the most heartwarming and memorable episodes of The Twilight Zone. It receives ample amounts of praise to this day for its sincere Christmas spirit and authentic performance from star Art Carney. Upon another rewatch, you can see where some of the inspiration might have come from with a movie like Miracle on 34th Street debuting in theaters about 13 years prior. Also, while handled completely differently here, the idea of a drunken mall Santa is decently similar to the 2003 dark comedy Bad Santa. The Night of the Meek got remade for the 80s version of the series, but this is definitely the iteration everyone loves talking about, so let's talk about it. Henry Corwin is a world-weary alcoholic whose only real joy comes from playing Santa Claus at his local mall every year for the children who stop by to see him. After being fired for another inebriated appearance, Corwin sulks until he discovers a bag of presents laying in an alley. He starts handing out its contents to people in the neighborhood and sees that every gift given is exactly what the person wants most for Christmas. Soon enough, he's taken into police custody on suspicion of stealing the items in the bag, but when those items seem to change into empty cans and a stray cat, he's released, and later finds what he really wants for the holiday season. Jack Smite returned to direct the third of his four episodes and his second in the videotape format. While one of the better, if not the best, of the six episodes produced this way for budgetary reasons, the videotape production gives The Night of the Meek a distinct look from the rest of the series, which was shot on film. While shooting this way was a hindrance for most of the other five episodes, it didn't affect the overall quality of this one. In fact, within the commentaries on the Blu-ray set, a few people mentioned that it might have actually helped this story. I will say that it makes this installment stand out a bit more. However, one can't help but wonder how much this could have been improved by the usual cinematic effort that went into a majority of the other episodes. Supposedly, this script was written because Rod Serling wanted to see Art Carney play Santa Claus. Known mostly at the time for his run on the 1950s TV series The Honeymooners and The Jackie Gleason Show, Carney brought a real genuine quality to his performance as Henry Corwin. He's a believable drunk, but there's so much more going on under the surface with this character. I just wish Mr. Dundee on one Christmas, only one, that I could see some of the hopeless ones and the dreamless ones. Just on one Christmas, I'd like to see the meek inherit the earth. That's why I drink, Mr. Dundee. And that's why I weep. There's no question how great Carney is in the role. One scene in particular, we see how much he cares for the children he speaks of as they pitifully ask him for wishes he can't grant. It's really heartbreaking, and one of the times Serling's sentimentality landed big time. Corwin's spirits lift once he finds purpose in bringing joy to those around him. This is where we see the hopeful side of the character that adds to Carney's dynamic turn. I'm inebriated with joy and delight, yes, Officer Ryan. <laughs> John Fielder plays Mr. Dundee, the store manager, who you may recognize from his work throughout the years in classics like Twelve Angry Men or voicing Piglet in many Winnie the Pooh projects. Personally, I don't think he was a great fit for a role like this. It would have been more appropriate to see someone with a more intimidating presence accept the holiday spirit as the episode goes on for a more dramatic character arc. He's unlikable, but in the wrong way, in my opinion. How nice it will be to see my wistful St. Nicholas going up the river. Do you suppose he can get as much as 10 years? After Corwin is released, he gives away the rest of the gifts that appear in the bag and sits pondering his night. The only wish he has for himself is to bring joy to others as the biggest gift giver of all time every single year. Moments later, he finds a sleigh with eight reindeer attached. An elf pops out informing him that they have a lot of hard work to do to get ready for next Christmas. Corwin hops in the sleigh and dashes off to the surprise of Mr. Dundee and the police officer who brought in Henry. The episode ends on a hopeful Christmas narration from Rod Searle. In short, there's nothing mightier than the meek. And a Merry Christmas to each and all.
the spirit of the season does come through quite a bit on the Night of the Meek. That may be due to the fact that they shot it just three weeks before it aired on December 23, 1960. Having so many children on set added an extra bit of magic to the production, according to on-set accounts. Serling even named the main character after his idol, writer Norman Corwin. So there was a lot of sentimentality baked into the story from the very beginning. I don't necessarily agree with many critics and fans who call it one of the best Twilight Zone episodes, period, but I do see the appeal. I think Rod's more whimsical side worked best when he gave us a bittersweet story. And while The Night of the Meek features a character who gives up on the good in the world only to find his true calling by the end, there's just something missing from it for me. Maybe I need to watch it again around Christmas to really feel that attachment, but regardless, it is a recommendation on principle because everyone deserves to feel the Christmas slash holiday spirit, even in the Twilight Zone. Douglas Hayes was back again to direct his penultimate episode, Dust. This one proved to be a departure for him, as it's pretty much just a straight-up western with a little magic thrown in. It saw the return of a couple recognizable faces from previous episodes, but does that make it a must-see installment of The Twilight Zone? Set in a melancholy small town in the Old West, Dust follows the story of Luis Gallegos. A few nights previous, he drunkenly ran over and killed a little girl while riding his wagon. Louise was quickly sentenced to hang at the behest of the girl's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Canfield, and is constantly taunted by the slimy town salesman, Sykes. While Sykes sold the rope that is going to hang the young man, he gets another idea when he sees Louise's father begging for mercy. The peddler fills a small bag with dirt and flaunts it as magic dust that turns hate into love, the only thing that can change the hearts of the town and save Gallegos' son. Desperate, Louise's father pays for the dust and rushes to the gallows in hopes of saving his boy. This was a pretty dour episode with not a lot of energy to it. According to Hayes, that was by design. He wanted to give everyone in this small town a sense of hopelessness, like they all gave up on having a good life long ago. Rod Serling's original script had just about the same tone, but he did give the sheriff character a more confident and upstanding demeanor. Hayes changed that to give him an attitude similar to the rest of the town. He described it as listless. While Sheriff Koch wasn't really a coward or anything like that, he did little to stop the town from turning to its darker impulses. Everyone just sort of moves like zombies who are slowed down by a deep, profound sadness. And that emotion isn't limited to the event that killed the little girl. It's explained by Luis's father that his son drinks so much because of that mutual sorrow everyone in the town has grown up on. He had this sadness, deep inside, sadness that there was not enough to eat, sadness that they had no work, sadness the earth all around him was growing barren in the sun. Vladimir Sokolov stands out for his believable, anguished pleas for his son's life. Credit to Serling's writing and Sokolov's delivery for creating such a sympathetic character. He has the same deep-set misery as the rest of the town, but he's able to expound on that emotion in a strong performance. The exception to Hayes' low-energy rule was Thomas Gomez's Sykes. From the beginning, that character is filled with a boisterousness that's easy to remember since he has the only lively personality. Sykes is a real unscrupulous agent with no shame. He mocks Louise from outside his jail cell before tricking his sister and father into buying the magic dust. And he does it all with an evil grin and ridiculing laugh. 100 pesos of worth of magic dust. <laughs> While he's probably the best thing about this episode, Gomez is more memorable for me in his first trip to the Twilight Zone. He played Mr. Cadwallader, aka the Devil, in Escape Clause. We reviewed this season 1 episode last year, so go check out my full thoughts on that if you'd like a refresher. Gomez was great in that story too, but I feel like he wasn't involved in an episode worth his talent for either of his appearances. Sykes attends the public execution of Louise to sadistically watch Gallegos make a fool of himself. But things don't go quite the way he planned. Just before the sheriff drops Louise with the rope around his neck, Gallegos runs in front of the crowd to throw the faux magic dust on the mild mob. They hit to the magic! 
Magic! Magic! <laughs> you must take it. He repeats that line about 50 more times until the trap door drops behind him, but when he looks back, Gallego sees that his son is still alive. Louise's rope broke and he was spared the hanging. The crowd is shocked and confused. Sykes mentions that it's impossible. He sold the sheriff a brand new rope. It was five strand hemp and inexplicably, it snapped. The sheriff asks the Canfields if they want a second attempt, but they refuse. We leave it like this. One victim is enough. I think we should all go home now. The crowd leaves the sheriff to inform Louise and his father that the young man can go free. Gallegos is convinced that the magic dust worked, turning everyone's hate into love. This further perplexes Sykes. Confused, but eventually believing the same, he walks away, giving the gold pieces Gallegos paid him to a few begging children. We then end on a shot of the broken rope. All in all, Dust doesn't have much going for it. Considering the fact that one of the Twilight Zone's greatest directors was at the helm, one would have expected more. Even the production is clunkier than usual, with a lot of obvious ADR toward the beginning and creased backgrounds behind the gallows at the end. Granted, we only notice those kinds of details now that it's in HD. Back when this aired in 1961, I highly doubt anyone caught that sort of stuff. But it is odd since Douglas Hayes was usually so meticulous with his production design and visuals. He did manage to give his young son a cameo though, so that's a notable tidbit. Jerry Goldsmith did the music here, but it doesn't ever rise above your standard, dreary Old West style ambience. I feel they could have easily gotten away with stock music and saved Goldsmith for a better episode. In the end, Dust is a heavy-handed, slow, dull installment of the show and not at all indicative of Douglas Hayes' talent as a director. It's not bad, but I wouldn't recommend it. I'd instead suggest Escape Clause for Thomas Gomez's superior character, Execution or Mr. Denton on Doomsday for a better Old West episode, and just about any other installment directed by Hayes. Like a tumbleweed blowing across the desert, it's best to let this one pass you by and move on to a more thought-provoking story in the Twilight Zone. Back There is yet another time travel episode written by Rod Serling. This one surrounds the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln at the hands of John Wilkes Booth. We'd see Serling cover different historical eras with other time travel episodes, but this one feels a little closer to the Twilight Zone's original proof of concept, which led to the pilot order at CBS. That being the Westinghouse Desilu Playhouse episode called The Time Element, which focused on Pearl Harbor. Peter Corrigan is a patron of the Potomac Club in Washington, D.C., where a few of his fellow members are having a discussion about time travel over a game of cards. Corrigan argues that major events in the past cannot be changed, while one of his friends say that it's highly probable history would alter just by the mere presence of a person out of time. When Corrigan leaves the club, he's struck with a headache that results in finding himself nearly 100 years in the past on the night of President Lincoln's assassination. He tries to warn the security at the Ford Theater and the authorities of the exact details surrounding the president's demise, but they think he's drunk or disturbed and throw him in jail. However, a man nearby, claiming to be an expert in mental illness, hears his cries throughout the streets and convinces the police to release the admitted war veteran into his custody. This mustachioed player has more to do with the history of this fateful night than he at first lets on. David Oric McDearman returned to direct his final episode with Back There. His previous two were the recently reviewed A Thing About Machines and another time travel story, Execution, from season one. That installment also starred Russell Johnson, but in a more supporting role. He took the lead here, and while his vocals are great, some of his expressions and body language don't quite hold up to modern viewing. A nitpick overall, but that did stick out to me a bit. Most of the other performances are decently strong and don't suffer from that issue. I think the look and tone of this episode are among its stronger aspects. Some of the floating camera work by cinematographer George T. Clemens is especially beautiful. My favorite shot consists of a really well done transition when Corgan is transported to the past. The camera pans over to a light that dissolves into a gas lamp and swoops back to Corgan, who's now in 1860s apparel. One cut later, we pull back to see the full town complete with extras walking around and horse-drawn carriages trotting through the streets. Corgan is overwhelmed by this experience and sprints off screen to complete a wonderfully executed composition. 
The tone, visuals, and pretty much everything else are greatly enhanced by a phenomenal Jerry Goldsmith musical score. It increases the sense of dread when Peter finds himself in the past and the impending doom of this pivotal evening in the United States history. Combining a harpsichord sound with those deep, dark orchestral harmonies produced something truly memorable. I'd say the music is worth listening to on its own. Even without the visuals, you can still feel the gravitas and haunting nature of it. Goldsmith composed several distinctive scores for other Twilight Zone episodes, and I'd say this is right up there with the best of them. In a surprise to probably no one, the guy who took Peter under his care that looks just like John Wilkes Booth is indeed John Wilkes Booth. He gives Corrigan a sedative inside some wine he provided, which frees Booth up to fulfill his destiny and take his iniquitous place in history. One of the police officers from the station actually believed Peter's story and rushes to the room he was taken to to find Corrigan passed out on the ground. As he tries to help the man out of time to his feet, they hear that President Lincoln has been shot. It's too late. Corrigan pounds on the window expressing his rage of nobody believing him and once again finds himself transported. This time it's back where he started, in present day at the Potomac Club. He enters to see everything is back to normal, except that one of the attendants who work there is now a wealthy member of the club. William says he inherited his fortune that started with his great-grandfather, who just so happened to be the only police officer that believed Peter back in 1865. He went around that night trying to convince people that the president was in danger. While nobody bought it at the time, his knowledge of the event before it happened caused a stir in town that people never forgot. This led to him becoming police chief and eventually a millionaire. So while the major historical event wasn't changed, there were a few ripples created by Corrigan's trip to the past. In shock, Peter then discovers John Wilkes Booth's handkerchief still in his pocket as the episode finishes. This story isn't too fondly remembered, with even producer Buck Houghton not being a fan of it. However, I personally think there's enough here for a recommendation. The largest part of that is Jerry Goldsmith's score, yet there are a few other elements that kept me interested. It felt like this was a great episode just waiting to break out, but there wasn't sufficient time to raise it to its full potential. Check it out and see what you think. It's a story that proves some things can't be changed, even in The Twilight Zone. The whole truth is a bit of a mess. There's a good enough concept in there with some good actors trying to make it work, but it suffers from several different issues that tank a once promising premise by the end. Harvey Honeycutt is the proprietor of a used car lot where he constantly swindles customers out of their money by sticking them with less than serviceable vehicles. An older man shows up one day looking to sell his vintage Model A car, which Honeycutt buys for only $25. As soon as the purchase is complete, the old man tells Harvey that in addition to many mechanical issues, the vehicle is haunted. Honeycutt laughs him off, but soon he starts to discover that he could no longer lie. This wreaks havoc on his business and personal relationships. Later, a politician named Luther Grimbley asks a few questions about the car and sees firsthand that Honeycutt isn't lying when he says owning it forces one to always tell the truth. The pair then see a story in the paper that finally brings a smile to Harvey's face. This was the first of six episodes directed by James Sheldon. He'd go on to helm a few strong and memorable installments of the series, but unfortunately, this was not one of them. It's another one of the episodes that was recorded on tape to conserve cash and bring down the budget, but the overall visual quality is hampered quite a bit here. And again, Rod Serling's on-screen narration looks especially affected as he's seen obviously reading off cue cards. Now, all of this can easily be looked past if the story, performances, and execution is solid. That's not the case with the whole truth. It's bogged down by bad pacing, a limited and unremarkable location, and a script that seems like it would have worked as a 5-10 to 10 minute short film, yet is stretched to the standard nearly 26 minutes. There are some decent performances here, as Jack Carson is doing his damnedest to keep this thing afloat, but his charisma can only carry this ship so far. 
How he's almost possessed to tell the truth is probably the best aspect of the episode. It's not over-exaggerated, and I like that. It's more of an unstoppable stream of consciousness thing. His normally boisterous voice goes almost monotone, while his face surprisingly reacts to what his mouth is saying. What I'm going to be doing tonight is I am going to be playing poker with the boys. What I'm really going to be doing tonight is I am going to be playing poker with the boys. The concept of someone not being able to lie is likely more recognizable to modern audiences from the 1997 Jim Carrey movie Liar Liar. And while that's one of Carrey's most well-known prime comedies, seeing it done more elaborately with more time and a stronger narrative doesn't make the whole truth look bad by comparison. Its problems are plain to see in an isolated viewing, like one of the worst punches I have ever seen thrown in a TV episode or movie. In his short appearance, which you can see as a positive or negative, Loring Smith's performance as Luther Grimbley is off-the-wall bonkers. He dramatically outshines the already animated Jack Carson with some way out there deliveries and facial expressions. Maybe, uh, 50 bucks? 50 bucks? All right, maybe 60. You better trot out the strings, buddy boy. Trot out the strings. I want to know what I'm getting. Car is haunted. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that what Honeycutt and Grimbley were looking at was a newspaper story about visiting Soviet Union leader Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev and his driver arrived to purchase the car on the cheap to, I think, exploit shoddy American workmanship with a crappy old car? Honestly, I'm not really sure. But he drives off in the Model A, and as the owner, he can no longer lie. Inside, Harvey then gets on the phone. Can you get me through to Jack Kennedy? Funnily enough, this episode premiered on the same day Kennedy was inaugurated as the U.S. president. I will say this whole thing with Khrushchev is an oddly specific political twist for one of Serling's Twilight Zone scripts. He's usually a bit more subtle in his parallels to reality. But then again, he did use political figures a few times to make his point across the series. This particular one, however, just seems to come out of nowhere. Yes, giving the car to a politician so they can't lie is a fine ending, but you'd think it'd just be the mayor or something. Instead, they went pretty big with this finish, and the episode is worse off for it, in my opinion. If I were to tell you the whole truth, I'd tell you to leave this lemon of an episode in the Twilight Zone. The Invaders is the definition of a classic Twilight Zone episode. It utilizes components of horror in combination with small-scale elements to give us a one-of-a-kind story starring just a single actor on screen. The ending twist is one of the more memorable in the show's history, and several production pieces are among the most recognizable the series ever produced. A nameless woman lives a simple life alone in her secluded cabin. As she makes dinner for herself one evening, a loud, strange noise disrupts the peaceful night. She slowly climbs to the roof to find a miniature flying saucer-type spaceship has just landed. Small creatures in spacesuits then emerge, and what follows is a game of survival. The creatures stealthily attack her with futuristic weapons while hiding in her primitive home. Richard Matheson wrote this episode, and while it's a favorite of many fans, he was less than thrilled with it. He was quoted in Mark Zickery's The Twilight Zone Companion book as saying, quote, I never liked it. I thought those little roly-poly dolls were ridiculous looking. To see these little things waddling across the floor was about as frightening as Peter Rabbit coming at you, end quote. While this is indeed a classic, I can see the reaction to it being somewhat split. The material takes itself very seriously. Yet the villains are a few mini spacemen who aren't exactly intimidating looking. Personally, I love these little things, and in a show like The Twilight Zone, I think they fit right in. They were designed and puppeteered by director Douglas Hayes. Hayes used to draw for Disney, so he was skilled in coming up with character designs. After drawing what he wanted, the makeup team put together the figures with foam rubber and painted them gold for optimal reflective lighting. Hayes made them walk by placing his fingers into the legs and pantomiming the motion. He wore a black sleeve that blended into the shadows as he was controlling them. Oh, by the way, can you guess which movie they borrowed the flying saucer from? Yes, of course, it's Forbidden Planet. If you've watched these videos for a while, you know the drill by now. 
The director was also responsible for the suspenseful slow pacing. The build-up to the spaceship reveal and the stalking that happens afterward is all handled with precise care. Hayes wanted to minimize the amount of cuts in the episode and follow the main character around for long shots. This took a lot of rehearsal but worked out in the end. He mentioned years later that they only shot about seven or eight pieces of film for the whole show. Equally as important was the lighting. The cabin was supposed to have no electricity, so pinpoint cues would have to be hit when the character was moving from room to room or repositioning her light source. This was done by having about a half dozen crew members on light dimmers that slid on and off as she walked through the house. Helping guide the viewer through this more horror-driven story was the music of the legendary Jerry Goldsmith. Like other episodes he scored, the music isn't used wall to wall. In a story like this one, sometimes silence is more effective. But when the music kicks in, it's distinct, appropriate, and ups the feeling of anxiety shared by the woman on screen. This was the last of the seven credited installments Goldsmith worked on. While portions of his score showed up in other episodes as stock music, this was his last official full Twilight Zone soundtrack, at least until the 1983 movie. Agnes Moorhead plays the unnamed woman here, and she may have a recognizable face to people who grew up watching the 1960s sitcom Bewitched. Moorhead portrayed Sam's mother and Dora for the entire run of that series. She also appeared in Citizen Kane and a slew of other projects throughout the years. This character has no spoken lines, so her facial expressions and body language were all she had to work with. Moorhead does a really great job at reacting to the surreal situation she finds herself in. Considering what happens in the twist, her performance holds up even better on multiple viewings. After being stabbed, sliced, and shot with radioactive gun rays, the woman finally bests the mini invaders and kills them, destroying their ship with an axe last. As she hacks away, we hear the voice of the remaining spaceman, provided by Douglas Hayes himself, desperately warning his comrades to stay away. Incredible race of giants here! Race of giants! Too much for us! Too powerful! Stay away! <laughs> The invaders were actually humans from Earth the whole time, while the woman defending her home was a giant alien on a foreign planet. It is a great twist and enhances Agnes Moorhead's performance. You'll notice through the whole episode that she acts very strangely. She rarely uses her voice at all, and when she does, it's not to speak or yell in a way we're used to. Her movements are shown to be slightly different as well. If you rewatch this episode, you can easily see things from the astronaut's perspective. They didn't necessarily strike first and are trying to hide from this giant alien. It's just an excellent twist and one many admirers of the show still remember fondly. The Invaders was the last episode of the nine Douglas Hayes helmed. He was a very hands-on director and often altered story elements to fit his own creativity. Producer Buck Houghton often said he would choose Hayes to direct more challenging episodes because he knew he'd be able to handle it. Without a doubt, Hayes put his own stamp on all his work within this series. He's arguably the best director the show ever had. With outstanding installments to his name like Elegy, Nervous Man in a Four Dollar Room, and Eye of the Beholder, it can be hard to pick a favorite. Even on the rare times he didn't make a great episode, there was something memorable about how he approached the work. It's a shame that the show went on for so long after this without Hayes returning, but his impact on the Twilight Zone is undeniable. For me, this episode was a little better than I remember it after seeing it for the first time years ago. I love the music, performance, pacing, and design of the astronauts. Of course it's a little goofy, but that was the charm of the series. Without a doubt, this one gets my recommendation to watch or rewatch. The invaders, who found out that a one-way ticket to the stars beyond has the ultimate price tag in the Twilight Zone. A Penny for Your Thoughts is a nice light episode that made use of a more comedic tone. Sometimes with these scripts, an intentionally funny mood would be a detriment. It'd come off too forced or awkward, but because of George Clayton Johnson's script, James Sheldon's direction, and the effortlessly likable presence of Dick York, this story works as a comedy with an undercurrent of earnest sentimentality. One morning on his commute to the bank, Hector B. Poole pays for his newspaper with a quarter that lands on edge. 
Immediately after, he begins hearing people's thoughts. While attending to his job, he's able to listen in to his coworkers and customers' innermost musings. For example, this enables him to discover his coworker Helen's crush on him and that his boss, E.M. Bagby, is cheating on his wife and has a getaway weekend planned with his mistress. Soon enough, Poole informs Bagby of a plot by a customer to borrow $200,000 from the bank to bet on horses under the guise of a business loan. Also, the bank's oldest employee, L.J. Smithers, ponders on how he's going to walk out with a briefcase full of the bank's money after work and escape to Bermuda that evening. Poole continues to inform his superior of these schemes, but it's hard to convince anybody of his premonitions without them thinking he's gone off the deep end. George Clayton Johnson had sold a couple short stories to The Twilight Zone the previous season, which were made into the episodes The Four of Us Are Dying and Execution. But with a penny for your thoughts, Johnson was adamant that he be allowed to write the teleplay. It took some convincing, but producer Buck Houghton eventually relented, and most of the staff were pleased with the results. Johnson wasn't as prolific on the series as the other writers that helped Serling, like Charles Beaumont or Richard Matheson, but he's probably right under them on the amount of episodes he was able to write. He penned four more after this one. A touching story Johnson told in the commentary track, as well as a 1978 interview available on the Blu-ray set, had him recalling how he was allowed on set while they were shooting this installment. He really looked up to Rod Serling, who showed him off and talked him up to a few guests that were around that day. Complimentary words that went a long way for Johnson, and gave him more confidence moving forward. It's always great to hear those kinds of stories about Rod. By all accounts, he seemed like such a swell guy. Johnson also remembered how Dan Tobin, the actor who played E.M. Bagby, suggested to him that this concept could be made into a series. Each week, a new person would come into possession of the on-edge coin and gain the ability to read minds. The writer even came up with a pilot script that followed a man who made a fortune gambling with this power. The series never materialized, but A Penny for Your Thoughts cemented Johnson's style, and we'd see him do much more in the years to come. This was the second episode to air, directed by James Sheldon. He'd proceed to direct four more installments, with a few well-known ones to his name. Sheldon's approach to the comedy here worked well, but the main aspect to it that landed best was the star, Dick York. York had appeared in one episode the previous season, but his natural comedic ability and innate charm was on full display in this story. Of course, we know he'd go on to become more famous for his role in the sitcom Bewitched, but his two Twilight Zone appearances are memorable. They show off his range, and what a star in the making he really was. With its more airy nature, A Penny for Your Thoughts doesn't bring up too many deep emotions or, no pun intended, thought-provoking themes but it accomplished what it set out to do and is executed well. The true moral of the story presents itself near the end. After convincing Bagby of Mr. Smithers' thoughts of theft, they stop the old man before leaving, only to discover that he hadn't taken a dime. Poole is fired for the gaff and apologizes to Smithers, who asks Hector how he knew of his thoughts. Smithers explains that he often daydreams of taking the money and skipping town, but never actually plans on doing it. Beautiful exotic places where there are no books to keep. Where I'm not a little man with no future and no past. But I'll never go through with it. You know what? I'm old and set in my ways. I guess I'm a coward. It's a surprisingly poignant monologue by actor Cyril Delevante that gives this story more heart. I enjoyed that quite a bit. After hearing this, Hector is spurred on by Helen to stand up for himself to Mr. Bagby, who just offered Poole his job back after hearing the customer that came in earlier was arrested for gambling with company money. A more confident Hector requests a promotion, but after Bagby refuses, Poole blackmails him with the knowledge of his vacation of infidelity that weekend. The manager submits to Poole's demands, the last of which guarantees a trip to Bermuda for Mr. Smithers. Hector leaves with Helen as they pass the same newsstand from earlier. He tosses another quarter into the box that knocks over the one that landed on edge that morning. Suddenly, Poole's gift is gone. He can no longer hear others' thoughts. Relieved and delighted, he walks off with Helen as the episode ends. This is a fine story with a very likable lead. The only semi-major problem I have with it is how Hector blackmails his boss at the end. Johnson mentioned in the commentary track that he also worried he'd lose the audience with that turn. There were ways around this issue where Poole didn't have to come off as slightly complicit in Bagby's affair. Simply standing up to him and demanding what he earned would have sufficed. 
or maybe he'd take the more altruistic route of telling his boss to stop his extramarital affairs. Although I will say the addition of a gifted vacation for Mr. Smithers was a sweet notion that brought me back on board a bit. Just a flaw in my opinion in an otherwise pleasant and heartfelt installment. If you want to see all of George Clayton Johnson's episodes or are a fan of Dick York, I'd say give this one a view, but it's not required watching in the grand scheme of the series. If you're looking for the best of the best, a penny for your thoughts is worth more than one red cent, but it's not what I would call essential. Either way, the next time you think you're reading someone's inner thoughts based on their expression alone, remember that sometimes we all think about actions we'd never take, or take those actions without thinking at all. A moral to keep in mind, whether you're in or out of the Twilight Zone. Is it some cosmic coincidence that 22 is our 22nd episode reviewed in the second year I've been covering this series, and it's a part of the show's second season? Sounds like something that could only happen in... Well, we'll get to that later. Liz Powell is a professional dancer who's been hospitalized for exhaustion. She begins having recurring nightmares where Powell approaches the morgue, marked as room number 22, in the basement of the hospital, where a nurse grimly greets her with ominous words. Room for one more, honey. After several more days of rest, she's released from the hospital and prepares to get on a flight to Miami. But once at the airport, Liz starts to feel an all too familiar set of emotions. 22 was written by Rod Serling, but based on an anecdote from a 1944 anthology called Famous Ghost Stories, edited by Bennett Cerf. That anecdote was based on a 1906 short story called The Bus Conductor by E.F. Benson, so there's some history behind this premise. Serling kept the main idea, but changed just about everything else around it. Honestly, it feels quite a bit like season one's Perchance to Dream. That was the first episode written by Charles Beaumont and featured a similar-ish concept that saw our main character seeking treatment for the intensity of his dreams. I'd say Perchance to Dream was executed better, but there are things to like about this one. It was the last episode directed by Jack Smite, and while it's not his best, see season one's The Lonely for his greatest Twilight Zone work, it's not what I would call bad, although he didn't seem to think highly of 22. Smite would later comment about how he didn't believe it had the quality of some of the other episodes he directed. This was another of the productions that were forced to use videotape instead of film to save money, but you can see the team tried to still give this story the drama it needed. Heavy shadows and some fun effects were used appropriately to raise it up a few notches. Barbara Nichols as Liz Powell turns in a solid performance. She reacts believably to the more horrific scenes and always feels on edge when she's talking to her manager or doctor. Speaking of which, Fred Wayne as Barney is fine, but those glasses are hilarious. Must have been very stylish in the early 60s. The Doctor, played by Jonathan Harris, is one of the weaker parts of the episode. Every line he delivers and expression his face crinkles into would give Bela Lugosi's Dracula a run for his money. Remember about tonight, Miss Powell. Now relax. Get to sleep. He's played up to be creepy in his overall presence when talking about Liz's nightmares, but also when he gives her compliments on her appearance and job as a dancer. You make an old doctor wish he were a young intern. <laughs> <laughs> the next time I see you, I'll be at a ringside table, and I'd appreciate a, a subtle wink. <laughs> it just feels like way too much for a character that has little to no effect on where this episode was going. I understand they may have been trying to throw the audience off by giving this character an aura of darkness or dreamlike exaggeration, but it's more distracting than anything else. Plus, he looks like Harvey Keitel, which makes me wish we had him in one of these episodes, and of course, that never happened. The morgue nurse is played well by Arlene Martel. She had another small role in the episode What You Need and pulls off her famous line here perfectly. Her blank but menacing expression is appropriately unnerving. Room for one more, honey. When Liz gets to the airport, she experiences the same sense of doom felt in her dream. She tries to shake it off and goes to enter the plane where she's greeted by a familiar face. Room for one more, honey. Powell runs off terrified, only to see the plane explode in midair upon taking flight. More disturbed than ever, Liz's pained expression ends the episode. According to Mark Zickery's The Twilight Zone companion book, the explosion of the plane was done by rigging explosives to a model hanging from a wire. 
Unfortunately, the videotape used back then creates darkened artifacts around bright images, and the fiery demise of the aircraft is a victim of this. 22 isn't a great installment of the series, but the line, room for one more, honey, is decently well known to fans of the show. Plus, there are a few shots and other elements to be enjoyed. I'd give this one a soft recommendation, but it's not essential by any means. I suppose there will always be room for one more in a future screening that always takes place at 2.22 on the 22nd of February, every year, in the Twilight Zone. The Odyssey of Flight 33 is definitely one of the more unique time travel episodes of the original Twilight Zone run. There are a lot of behind the scenes tidbits about it out there as it used a few different filming techniques to achieve the visuals needed to tell the story. Most of the main cast appeared in other Twilight Zone episodes and when Rod Serling wrote the script, he even enlisted the help of his brother for a few specific details. Global Airlines Flight 33 is on their way to New York City from London. They're coming up on the last leg of their journey when the plane gets caught in a strange jet stream that heavily increases their ground speed. Simultaneously, they lose all communications and after shakily passing through what the captain describes as the sound barrier, he has no other choice but to bring the plane lower for visual confirmation of their location. It's a risky move because of potential collisions with other aircrafts, but with no other option, the move is made. They're able to recognize that they've reached New York, but to the shock of the crew, there's no city, no people. The situation becomes even odder when the plane passes by a dinosaur on the ground below. Flight 33 has traveled back in time. Keeping a cool head, the captain announces that the only way he can figure to get back home is to re-enter the jet stream and hope for the best. The aircraft then ascends back into the clouds as the passengers and crew prepare for another jump in time. Rod Serling's idea for this story was given more real-world credibility with the help of his older brother Robert. Robert himself was a novelist and an aviation writer who was responsible for a lot of the technical dialogue between the crew members. Many pilots later described the exchanges to be among the most authentic in any film or TV show episode up to that point. The older Serling would later fill the same role when Rod wrote the 1966 TV movie The Doomsday Flight. That film was about a terrorist planted bomb hidden within a plane and the events surrounding the ransom said terrorist demanded. It actually inspired several real-world copycat incidents where similar situations occurred. It happened often enough that in 1971, the FAA requested TV stations to stop airing the film completely. This was the first of three episodes directed by Justice Addis. Coincidentally, all three of them involved some sort of time travel. However, this one may very well be the most remembered by fans of the series. Considering Rod's script and how this story shook out, that's not surprising. The famous shots of the Brontosaurus were achieved with stop motion during the filming of the 1960 science fiction film Dinosaurs. And it wasn't just footage taken from the movie. The Twilight Zone production team were able to get those shots specifically for the show. Producer Buck Houghton said they were some of the most expensive single shots in the series' history, costing them a total of $2,500. Stock footage was used for when the plane was mid-flight and for one other spot we'll talk about in the twist section. The cast of the Odyssey of Flight 33 was solid. They were led by John Anderson, who we saw appear first in A Passage for Trumpet, and would see again in two more installments down the road. His Captain Farver is fine, but I felt like his performance was a little too rigid and unemotional for such a peculiar situation. You absolutely need a character like that to keep cool under the pressure and guide the ship, but it was almost to a fault here. A small outburst or raising of his voice just once would have gone a long way. Instead, his deep voice stays at the same steady tone for most of the episode. Thankfully, his facial expressions and some well-done understated delivery didn't make this too big of an issue for me. Supporting him were Paul Comey, Sandy Kenyon, Wayne Hefley, Betty Gard, and Nancy Rennick, who all appeared in multiple other Twilight Zone episodes. They were allowed to be a bit more emotional than their captain, but not by much. Nervous stares and mild confusion were about as far as they went. There was an intensity to their reactions, though. It's always bubbling just below the surface, and you can feel it when watching this one. The deliberate pace and mystery of the situation definitely helped keep me hooked to find out where all of this was going. 
After getting back into the jet stream and descending once again, the crew finds themselves back in a more modern New York. But when they try to reach air traffic control, the jargon they use isn't recognized. The crew soon figures out that they've jumped forward in time, but not far enough. The World's Fair seen below gives away that they're only in 1939, 22 years before the date they left London. With the jet in need of fuel but everyone on the plane out of their own time, Farber decides to risk it and ascend into the clouds once more, trying to bring everyone back to 1961. The episode ends there, with Rod warning us that if we ever hear the sound of jet engines flying atop the overcast, engines that sound searching and lost, engines that sound desperate, shoot up a flare or do something, that would be Global 33 trying to get home. I really like that open, haunting ending. It's a great narration piece from Rod, too. Within the bounds of the story, the plane can be anywhere in time. It's kind of half a ghost story in that we see the origin of this lost flight. There's an NBC show called Manifest that loosely extends the concept with the plane landing five years after it took off in what seemed like just a few hours for those on board. I never watched it though, so if you have, let me know what you thought of it. The stock footage I mentioned earlier was of the actual 1939 New York World's Fair, and it was a nice touch to see film of the real event. If you haven't figured it out, The Odyssey of Flight 33 gets a recommendation from me, as I think it's an important installment of the series. If I had any critiques, aside from John Anderson's somewhat monotonous performance, it's that we saw next to nothing of the passenger's experience on the flight. There's a short scene of two people talking to each other, however it's more of a throwaway exchange. The flight attendant does mention that some of these folks are hysterical, but again, we never see it on screen. We wouldn't have needed much, just a few sequences following the same passengers as they went through these events. I do believe that kind of thing is expanded on in the graphic novel that was made out of this episode, though. It changed a few things and was published in 2010, so if you want more of this idea, check it out. Or you can just fix your eyes to the sky and wonder if the next plane you see passing overhead is a lost 707. Looking to escape the Twilight Zone. It's always great to see Burgess Meredith in a Twilight Zone episode. Mr. Dingle the Strong was only his second appearance and it's packed with other recognizable talent too, both on camera and behind it. This was another one of Rod Serling's more comedic scripts which rarely worked well. However, there are several notable qualities about this one that are worth delving into. Luther Dingle is a wormy vacuum cleaner salesman who's routinely picked on by fellow bar patrons and children alike. Observing him is an invisible two-headed Martian looking to conduct an experiment on an Earthling, and they consider Dingle to be the ideal candidate. Weak, cowardly, and sub-physical. They imbue him with 300 times the average human strength, and very quickly, Dingle starts to realize what he can do. He starts performing feats of strength in public and gains the attention of the whole town. Eventually, Luther returns to the bar to be interviewed for a TV special where he draws an excited crowd. First thing I want to bring up is the name Dingle. There are two different accounts of where Rod got it from. In Mark Zickrey's The Twilight Zone Companion book, Zickrey states that it came from a reporter who mistakenly called the Al Denton character from Mr. Denton on Doomsday, Dingle. Rod liked this name and used it appropriately for this kind of character. In a commentary track on the Blu-ray set, Martin Grahams Jr., author of The Twilight Zone Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic, has a different story. He says Serling wanted to originally name the Al Denton character Al Dingle after a friend of his, but changed it during production. He then got another chance to use the name in this episode. It's not really a consequential factoid, but it is funny that there are disparate accounts of where a name like Dingle came from. John Brom was back to direct his first season 2 episode. It's the second and final time he worked with Burgess Meredith on the show, and since he's possibly the most well-known director from the original series, it's surprising that they were both stuck with this one. Critics at the time didn't like it much, and I can't say I disagree with them. It's not really the fault of anyone involved in the production of the episode itself. I'd say the issues lie in the script and the thin main idea. Yes, it's cool to see these two-headed aliens and the in-camera strength effects that were pulled off, but there was nothing challenging or overly interesting about the story. When you bring in Burgess and Brom, especially after the mega success of Time Enough at Last, 
one would expect them to not be saddled with an episode aimed to humor the audience instead of making them think. It just felt like wasted potential considering the talent involved. Don't get me wrong, Meredith is doing his best, but without a real point, everything that happens just feels a bit empty. Fortunately, both Brahm and Burgess went on to be involved in much better episodes. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Dingle the Strong had a solid cast. Don Rickles took his one and only trip into the Twilight Zone here, and it's nice to see him in something like this circa 1961. He has what's billed as a commentary track on the Blu-ray set, but it's actually just him talking for about three minutes. Guess he got tired of watching the episode pretty quick. James Milholland also shows up in a small part after appearing in season one's The After Hours. Quick shout out to James Westerfield, who plays the bartender, Anthony O'Toole. He's in one of my favorite movies of all time, On the Waterfront, so it was a pleasant surprise to recognize him on my latest rewatch. The Two-Headed Martian was played by Michael Fox, no, not that one, and Douglas Spencer. This was actually Spencer's last credit. He passed away five months before the episode aired. The Martian costume slash makeup definitely feels like classic Twilight Zone. I really like how they look with all the bells and whistles attached. The strength effects were also decently well done for the time. My favorite shot is when Dingle picks up the Don Rickles character, but they make no attempt to hide Burgess's stunt double. Rickles has a stuntman in a bald cap take his place for that shot too, but it's a little less obvious. Producer Buck Houghton mentioned that the strength effects forced Mr. Dingle the Strong to go $1,800 over budget. There are at least one aspect that's pretty fun about the episode. Seeing that Dingle has wasted his gift on petty exhibition, the Martians take away his powers. On their way out, they run into aliens from Venus, also invisible, who are looking to conduct intelligence experiments. The Martians suggest Dingle, and the Venusians proceed to make him 500 times smarter than the average human. Luther impresses the remaining bar patrons with his newfound mental capacity as the story wraps up. So the pair of nine-year-olds who play the Venusians are just perfectly weird. How they shimmy off when they walk is hilarious. They also dub in adult voices to make them sound even better. Sudden introduction of extreme intelligence. Find any interesting subjects? Prior to airing, they appeared in a 1960 edition of Life magazine to promote the show. These two kids are probably the best part of the episode. Unfortunately, that's not saying much. This is definitely a subpar installment of the series, and it's a shame they sort of wasted one of Meredith's four appearances. But he is able to rebound in spectacular fashion with his next. Serling later adapted this story in written form for a book release with other expanded episodes. He changed a few things here and there, but as for the version that hit the small screen in 1961, Mr. Dingle the Strong falls far from a recommendation. But if you want something goofy with a good cast and very odd sci-fi elements sprinkled in, you could get a kick out of it. Just don't kick too hard. Like Mr. Dingle, you might boot yourself right into the Twilight Zone. Static has an intriguing premise, but it doesn't go to the dark places writer Charles Beaumont would usually bring his scripts. It also lacks the romanticism of a well-done, nostalgic Rod Serling episode. So it sits in a bit of a weird middle ground with a cynical main character going through a smaller scale, Twilight zone -y situation. But is it still worth a recommendation? Let's find out. Ed Lindsay is an ornery older man who lives in a boarding house where most of the residents are mesmerized by television on a daily basis. Fed up with the mindless shows and advertisements he sees, he fetches his old radio from the basement and sets it up in his room. To his surprise, it begins playing music and programs from the 1930s and 40s. However, when he tries to show the other residents, Ed is never able to get that particular station to work. He eventually grows so attached to the old radio that a few of the boarders worry for his mental well-being and give the contraption to a junk trader. When Lindsay finds out, he rushes away to try and recover the last remaining buoy to his good old days. Static was directed by Buzz Kulik, and ends up being almost an inverse of the episode he helmed before this, The Trouble with Templeton. They're similar in the fact that both main characters long for their younger days and old relationships, but the conclusions they find themselves in by the end are very different. Kulik went on to direct six more Twilight Zones over the years, but this was the only one he had to shoot on videotape. 
Indeed, this was another of the six productions recorded on videotape to conserve money, complete with Rod's narrator eyelines going all over the place. While it doesn't heavily impact the installment's quality, it is noticeable and jarring when watching it back-to-back -back with an episode shot on film. However, Kulik compared it to live TV, which is where his career started. He said in an interview years later that this format was easier for him to work in than the single camera setups of the more standard cinematic Twilight Zone productions. He admitted it didn't work as well as the episodes he shot on film, but ended up happy with the work at the time, although Kulik also mentioned he remembers Static the least of the nine he directed in total. Charles Beaumont wrote this episode based on an unpublished story by O.C. Rich and changed quite a bit from the original. He villainized television as the entertainment medium of people who want to blankly stare at a flickering image as their brains turn to mush. This is exemplified in the advertisements shown early in the story. The new chlorophyll cigarette. The smoke that doesn't smell like tobacco, but smells good, green, cool, like grass. This was easily the weakest of Beaumont's six scripts up to this point. Where most of his other work left the viewer with a thought-provoking story or haunting feeling, Static falls well short of that standard. In spite of that, though, the episode does get better as it goes along and strikes at the heart of the matter in a well-acted scene from stars Dean Jagger and Carmen Matthews. At one point decades ago, they were engaged to be married, but for various reasons, including the declining health and death of Ed's mother, it didn't work out. Yet they've stayed at the same boarding house since then and still see each other every day. We had our chance and missed it, Ed. And now you love what we were, what we might have become together. You want to go back to 1940 and start all over again. Why do you think you keep hearing getting sentimental over you on the radio? That was our song, Ed. Get out of here, Vinny. Get out of here. Let me alone. It really is a well-performed exchange and still comes across as believable. Maybe in a longer format, it would have been enough to bring this episode up a few levels. On its own, the full sequence is worth checking out if you find yourself in the mood. After Vinny and Professor Ackerman get rid of the radio, Lindsay tracks it down at the junk traders and repurchases it for $10. Once he gets home and plugs it back in, I'm Getting Sentimental Over You comes on again, and we see a younger Ed and Vinny reunite. It's 1940, and the couple have another shot at happiness. A quick note about that ending scene. Vinny mentions Ed Wynn's old radio show. Wynn starred in two Twilight Zone episodes himself, so I thought that was a nice little nod if done intentionally. While the ending is an uncharacteristically sweet one for Beaumont, it feels rushed and lacks a more bittersweet, poignant punch that could have helped it stand out. The addition of makeup and wigs to Ed and Vinny do effectively pull off a convincing younger look for them that was foreshadowed in the picture we saw earlier in the episode. It would have been easy to just get a younger pair of actors, but I respect that they went for it, keeping Jagger and Matthews in the roles. Static has a few things going for it, especially the emotional scene between Ed and Vinny, but it doesn't have enough steam for me to recommend a watch or rewatch if you're combing through the series to find the best episodes. It may appeal to some, though, so if the concept interests you, turn on your radio, listen closely to the static, and break through to the fifth dimension known as the Twilight Zone. The Prime Mover is a somewhat typical Twilight Zone story about the danger of greed, but it separates itself in some big ways. Through a tale of telekinesis and gambling, we see a different ending than usual for a main character who acts this way. Also, we'll talk about how the credited writer, Charles Beaumont, based this script off another writer's story whose name was left off the episode due to a production error. Ace Larson works at a small town cafe with his girlfriend Kitty Cavanaugh and partner Jimbo Cobb. After a car crashes near the building, Ace and Jimbo rush out to help the passengers, but the vehicle is flipped over. Surrounded by high voltage, the pair can't enter to pull them out. To the surprise of Larson, Cobb flips the car back over with his mind, and for the first time, Ace discovers that Jimbo has telekinetic powers. A frequent gambler, Ace thinks they can use Jimbo's powers to make the money they've always missed out on as poor restaurant owners. The trio travels to Las Vegas, where Ace wins hundreds of thousands of dollars with the aid of Cobb's gift. But when he refuses to stop gambling, Kitty leaves the hotel. 
Covering up his heartache and feeding his habit, Ace picks up a cigarette girl named Sheila and challenges Big Phil Nolan, the highest roller in town, to a game of craps. The problem is, Nolan is a dangerous gangster from Chicago, and because of overuse, Jimbo's powers may be running out. When you watch the Prime Mover, you'll see the end credits spell out that it's written by Charles Beaumont. While that's true to a certain degree, there's more to it. What was missing in those titles was an acknowledgement of who was the writer of the original story Beaumont's script was based on. With some of his ideas not working for a new episode, Beaumont reached out to his friend, George Clayton Johnson, to see if he had anything he could work with. It turns out, Johnson had a story that Beaumont liked called The Trouble with Teleportation. He paid Johnson $600 for the story and developed it into a script Rod Serling liked quite a bit. Beaumont changed a few things in his adaptation, including the title, but the basics were intact. George was set to retain story credit in the episode, however, because of an error through producer Buck Houghton, Johnson's name did not show up. Even on IMDb, they still don't have Johnson's name listed, which is kind of ridiculous. This is common knowledge among people who've researched the show. George himself had a commentary track on the Blu-ray set where he explains the situation in detail. There were no hard feelings, but it is a surprising oversight for such a writer-driven show. Speaking of which, this was yet another episode someone threatened to take legal action against Rod Serling for. They claimed the story had been stolen from a script sent into the show called The Powers That Be or Not Be. Serling shut the guy down pretty quick and no official action was ever taken. This became a common occurrence over the years, with a lot of people citing the vaguest of comparisons to state their usually flimsy cases. Richard L. Bear was back to helm his second episode of the second season, and he seemed like a good fit. There's nothing overly unique or flashy about this one compared to something like Third from the Sun or To Serve Man, but it's a solid chapter in his Twilight Zone filmography. I wish I could give him credit for the very impressive car crash at the beginning of the installment, but that was stock footage matched seamlessly with the scene of the two actors in front of a similar looking wreck. The sequence was taken from the 1958 film Thunder Road, and it really got the action going here early on. What I can give Bear and the production team credit for are some of the telekinesis effects. From flipping the car over to levitating a bed, these stunts up the production quality a bit. The addition of a similar slot machine to the one used in The Fever and A Nice Place to Visit was also a detail I appreciated. While Dane Clark isn't written to be very likable in his role as Ace Larson, we do have another main character to feel a strong early attachment to with Buddy Epson's Jimbo Cobb. You may recognize Epson as Jed Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies. He played this kind of simple but noble role really well. We're made to feel the right mix of sympathy and admiration for the character as the story progresses. After Ace wins a boatload more money off of gangster Big Phil Nolan, thanks to a waning Jimbo, he decides to bet all his money on the next toss. Cobb tries to warn him to stop, but Larson doesn't listen and loses everything when the dice turns up the wrong number. Nolan takes the money and leaves Ace as poor as he's ever been. Jimbo mentions that he must have blown a fuse or something. His power no longer works. After a moment of disbelief, Ace comes back to reality, in a better state of mind for the loss. They return to the cafe where Larson rids the place of its one-armed bandit and proposes to Kitty. With the newly engaged couple's backs turned and satisfied with how things played out, Jimbo shows us that he never lost his powers, he just knew what was best for his friend. Rod reminds us of this moral as the story finishes on a happy note. Usually with a character like Ace, we'd see something bad happen to him at the end. Some sort of comeuppance or twisted irony that ends up putting a player like that in his place. I guess that kind of still happens, but in a very different way. He realizes his mistakes and is better off for it. That was a nice change of pace for this kind of episode. Overall, there's enough here to give the Prime Mover a recommendation. It's not quite top tier, but the pacing, performances, and message make it a worthwhile episode. So float your remote on over, flip on the TV, and enjoy this high-stakes trip into the Twilight Zone. Long Distance Call is notable on several grounds. It tells a spooky tale in a minimalistic setting and uses what you don't see to unnerve the viewer. Add a creepy little kid into the mix and the result is an effective Twilight Zone story. Little Billy Bales is celebrating his fifth birthday as his beloved grandma joins in the festivities following a health scare. The old woman clearly covets the boy as they are closer than Billy's mother would prefer. 
After gifting him a toy telephone, the grandmother becomes ill again, which leads to her death in the upstairs of the home. Soon after, Billy begins constantly talking on the toy telephone, and when his parents confront him about it, he says the deceased grandma is on the other end of the conversation. Worse yet, the voice he hears may be trying to convince Billy to join her in the great beyond. There's much to break down about the behind the scenes aspects of this episode, so we'll discuss that first before going into my opinion on the story. Long Distance Call was the last episode to air of the six in season two that were shot on videotape in an attempt to save some cash on the expensive show. While they did reduce the cost by about $5,000 per production, the benefits of using film outweighed the budgetary issues, and at Rod Serling's urging, the series went back to shooting on film in March of 1961. I will say though, this episode, with its camera setups and such, comes across much closer to the filmed episodes than most of the other taped ones. The script was originally submitted by William Idelson, who appeared as an actor on The Twilight Zone in the episode A World of Difference. He would later go on to write for The Dick Van Dyke Show, The Flintstones, Happy Days, and a whole bunch of other series, but this was the first script he sold. He was friends with Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont, who of course were the other writers on The Twilight Zone. Beaumont liked the script enough to help Idelson rework it so it'd be accepted as an episode. They ended up splitting screen credit for the job in the final piece. Working as a real estate agent at the time, Idelson stated that he based the story on a real-life occurrence that he fictionalized. His mother got his son a toy telephone for the kid's second birthday, and after seeing her talk to him on it, the idea was sparked. After this episode hit the airwaves, he quit his job and became a writer full-time. However, this was another one of the installments that got hit with a couple of lawsuits by people who submitted scripts for the show. Settlements were made, but from what I found, the only similarity was the element of a magic phone. James Sheldon returned to direct his third episode and would work with child star Billy Moomy again in the more well-known installment It's a Good Life the following season. Mumi is very recognizable to Twilight Zone fans for his three appearances. While he may be most famous for playing Will Robinson in the original Lost in Space series, he still acts to this day and is fondly remembered as a pretty creepy kid actor in roles like this one. Now his character in It's a Good Life is much more menacing, but his ignorance to the eerie situation he's in here reads as a bit spooky. She wanted to know if I can come stay with her. Can I, Mama? Can I? The overuse of the head tilt is funny, but also a bit uncomfortable. There's a scene where Chris, Billy's dad, explains why his mother was so infatuated with the child. She had two children before me. She lost them both. She just couldn't let go. That was all she had. Except for Billy. But Billy was me again. A chance to go back, to pretend out all those other years never happened. It's a short scene, but succinctly adds some shading to the grandma character, and a little background to her relationship with her son's family. After finding out that Billy jumped in front of a car because the voice on the phone told him to, Chris and his wife, Sylvia, are relieved to see it was just a close call. Still thinking the boy is playing pretend, Sylvia becomes legitimately frightened when she enters Billy's room that night and takes the phone out of his hand. She listens in and hears the breathing of Chris's mother. Sylvia screams and drops the phone, which triggers Billy to run down the stairs and attempt to drown himself in the pond outside. Paramedics arrive to save the boy, but the odds aren't good. In a last ditch effort, Chris picks up the toy telephone in Billy's room and pleads with his mother to let the kid live. Immediately after his supplication, Billy starts to respond to treatment and is said to be okay. The Baylisses embrace in solace as Rod's narration wraps up the story. Chris's appeal to his dead mother was actually rewritten on set by Idelson and Beaumont after Serling requested a last minute change. Philip Abbott delivers the monologue very well, as it's one of the best parts of the episode. If you really love Billy, give him back. He's only five. He hasn't even started. He's hardly been out of this room. Out of this house. There's a whole world he hasn't even touched. I really like this one. It's successfully creepy in its concept and execution, with solid performances and writing. We never hear the grandma's voice on the phone and don't have to. Just the suggestion of it was enough. Long Distance Call is a recommendation from me, for sure. Dial it up where you can to check it out. And the next time you get a call from a number you don't recognize? It's probably someone trying to tell you your car's extended warranty is expired.
Uncle Ben travels through the desert with his sick young nephew Peter. Through a brief trip to the future, he finds out the boy grows up to become a hero, the amazing Spider-Man. Desperate to save this destined savior, he grabs modern medicine and rushes back to his brother's dying child. All right, that's not exactly what happens. I know he had a whole big career before the Spider-Man movies, but it's difficult for me to not see Uncle Ben when I look at the star of this episode, Cliff Robertson. Also, that's his character's son, not his nephew. We'll just consider that intro a mini fanscription episode. The year is 1847, and a caravan of settlers, led by Chris Horn, are heading west from Ohio. Horn's son is taken very ill, while the group at large wants to turn back. There's been no water for days, and everyone just seems like they're on their last legs. In a last-ditch effort to find water, shelter, or help of any kind, Chris decides to go out and check over the nearby rim. But when he does, he spots a paved road and devices hanging above it that he's not familiar with. He doesn't know it yet, but Horn has been transported to the year 1961. After nearly being hit by a truck and wounding himself with his own gun, he walks ahead until he finds a cafe. The owners, Joe and his wife Mary Lou, take the weary, out-of-place looking man inside where he tells them his story. The couple aren't sure what to make of Chris, but when Horn finds out he's over 100 years into the future, he slowly starts to believe there may be a reason for it. Some otherworldly justification why he was inexplicably launched into the future. Frequent director Buzz Kulik oversaw this production, and it's one of his better ones up to this point. He mentioned in an interview years later that it's one of his favorites. I can see why. Kulik had many gracious things to say about Cliff Robertson and his dedication to the character he was playing. Robertson was very involved in more than one aspect of creating Chris Horn. He wrote up nine pages of backstory on the character and handed it into Kulik to see if it contradicted his interpretation of the material. It was also Cliff's idea to go with the top hat and overall outfit his character ended up wearing. This decision was based on Robertson's research of settlers from the period. They usually didn't look like stereotypical cowboys. Many of them who started out further east in search of a new life in California left home with the clothes on their backs. However, cinematographer George T. Clemens supposedly took issue with the hat. He thought it would come off as comedic and even called up Rod Serling, who was not on set for this episode, and tried to get him to talk Robertson out of it. Rod actually agreed with Cliff and was all for making the character feel more authentic. Clemens later admitted that he was wrong in his assessment as it did add to the character's genuine appeal. The last significant change Robertson made to Horn was the addition of a slight accent. Cliff actually has a commentary track on the Blu-ray set where he explained his reasoning, and it was once again to make the character feel more real. He considered Horn first or second generation Irish, which is why the accent doesn't seem particularly prominent. I've got a real sick boy back in the wagon. Although they didn't know each other until meeting in Hollywood, Robertson and Serling actually attended the same college, Antioch, back in Ohio. Cliff's original aim was to be a journalist, which is maybe why he never hesitated to heavily research his roles when portraying a character like this. While Robertson later said he might have taken himself a little too seriously, it worked out for him here. It's a very strong performance, but what else could one expect from an Oscar and Emmy winner? Robertson would show up one more time for The Twilight Zone in a very different part the following season. The rest of the cast were solid in their supporting roles. John Crawford and Evans Evans, yes you heard that right, were believably caring in their wanting to help Chris. Ed Platt brought some dignity to the role of the doctor treating Horn, and John Astin, the original Gomez Adams himself, has a quick little appearance as Horn's friend Charlie. Chris eventually finds an encyclopedia that lists his son as a physician. Famous for his early work in childhood diseases, pioneer in vaccine research. That's my son. That's Chris. Believing he found his purpose for arriving in 1961, he takes some of the penicillin pills that were offered to him and tries to leave. However, the authorities have already been called in an attempt to help Horn. Despite his new friend's insistence, he's able to escape and sprint back to the rim he originally walked over. Joe and the police catch up to Chris, but after he disappears over the sand hill, the only thing found is his gun. Joe brings it back to the cafe, where he and Mary Lou are puzzled to see it's aged 100 years. Back in 1847, Chris has only been gone mere seconds, as he tells his wife to give their sick son two of the penicillin tablets. With knowledge of a natural spring nearby, thanks to Joe's mention, he leads his wagon train forward with confidence and optimism that they'll all be just fine. 
I enjoyed 100 yards over the rim. The look of the on-location exteriors blended well with the cafe interior shot at MGM. Also, there was a tangible reason Chris was sent forward in time, which made everything feel like it had more of an arc. The unexplainable is the usual for this show, but once in a while, it's nice to see what turned into a heartfelt story and on a happy note for the characters involved. I'd recommend giving this episode a view. Seek it out, but don't go too far. You might end up on the other side of the horizon, in another time, another place, known only as The Twilight Zone. The Rip Van Winkle caper was shot immediately after the previous episode, 100 yards over the rim. Since they both involved scenes that took place on location in the desert, just about the same areas were used. If there's an episode this one heavily reminded me of, it's I Shot an Arrow Into the Air from season 1. It's got a similar tone and follows more poor souls as they pace through the endless desert under an unforgiving sun. The Rip Van Winkle caper continues the legacy of other Twilight Zone episodes shot in the desert, like The Lonely and King Nine Will Not Return, but because of its diverting initial premise, it stands out as unique among its peers. After four crooks successfully steal a massive gold shipment, their leader, Farwell, has a plan to escape the authorities that's so crazy it just might work. An expert in noxious gases with a doctorate in both chemistry and physics, Farwell and his team hide in a nearby closed-off cave and enter suspended animation for 100 years. According to Farwell, when they awaken, they can re-enter the world rich beyond their wildest dreams, with not a single person chasing them down. But clashing personalities and pure greed threaten to upend Farwell's perfect master plan. Hot off the trails of the Odyssey of Flight 33, Justice Addis was back to direct a different kind of time travel story. The idea of suspended animation is one Rod Serling used several times in his scripts, but this one felt fresh since the concept hadn't been used in the Twilight Zone yet. The cave interiors were shot inside MGM Studios and the glass coffins were cool looking prop elements that added to this production's visual style. The shots of the crew slowly being surrounded by the gas were really ominous and gave that sequence an appropriately creepy tone. It's always great to see real locations on screen for these episodes, and all the exteriors for this one look great. This variety of settings gave the Rip Van Winkle caper a dynamic group of environments for us to be engrossed by. With the rocky dry landscape as a backdrop, this installment really shines in some great performances by Oscar Beregi Jr. as Farwell and Simon Oakland as De Cruz. These two had some strong tension in their chemistry that further elevated the story around it. The interactions they have later on in the episode are a definite highlight. Beregi traveled back into the Twilight Zone with two more appearances in Death's Head Revisited and Mute, while Oakland came back one more time in Season 4's The 30 Fathom Grave. All of the Season 4 installments were an hour long, and I'm looking forward to breaking down that one when we get to it down the road. When the team wakes up from their century slumber, they're not sure the plan worked until they discover one of their crew members, Irby, has been long dead. A rock fell and broke his glass chamber, which allowed the gas keeping him alive to escape. Maybe deciding to sleep in glass for a hundred years wasn't a great idea. The skeleton was a nice touch, though. Division among the remaining crew escalates when following an argument, De Cruz hits Brooks with their truck and kills him. It's not the best car collision we've seen on the show, but you have to respect the risk that stunt guy took being so close to a speeding vehicle. A century of sitting in a cave seems to have destroyed the brakes as the truck drives straight off a cliff just after De Cruz bails out. This leaves only Farwell and De Cruz to collect the stolen gold and try to reach civilization on foot. The pair of thieves walk through the desert with the gold bars on their backs. At some point early on, Farwell lost his canteen of water. De Cruz tells him he can have a swig of his for one gold bar, and it continues like that for hours under the scorching sun. When De Cruz ups the price to two gold bars, Farwell gets the jump on him and kills De Cruz with the very gold they were exchanging. Walking alone now with all he can carry, that being a single bar, Farwell collapses and is soon found by a passerby. He tries to offer the gold to the traveler for a ride into town, but Farwell's body gives out and he dies laying in the hot sand. 
Confused, the traveler returns to his futuristic car where his wife is waiting for him. He mentions he'll call the police to come pick up the body, but recalls how strange it was that the man offered him gold as if it were valuable. In this future, gold is now manufactured and worthless. I like this ending. Again, it's sort of similar to the twist in I Shot an Arrow into the Air, but leaves you with a bit of a different feeling. The four members of this crew weren't good guys, but desperation such as this has a way of stripping all of us down to the very base instinct of survival. And I personally didn't feel a strong sense of cosmic justice when the Farwell character died the way he did. I felt sorry for him, which means this was an effective way to create sympathy for a character like that. It also helps that De Cruz was much worse in comparison. His quick turn to murder came off as somewhat unpredictable, which kept me guessing where they were going with the story. One other production note I should mention is that the futuristic car the couple are seen driving at the end is from a very specific movie. You know the deal by now, right? It's yet another prop that was originally used in 1956's Forbidden Planet. Not as many props or as much footage was used this season compared to the first, but it's funny to hear that movie pop up so often in the behind-the-scenes history of so many episodes. I wanted to also mention that at the end of Rod Serling's on-camera tease of the following week's episode, he does a little ad read for a cigarette company. If you just took this puff, you'd agree. It's the softest taste of all. Before we meet again, try Oasis. It's so funny to see smoking promoted so heavily back in the day. He did one the previous week too, and that might be the first time I actually saw him puff a cigarette on camera in this show. Whenever he shows up as the narrator, he's usually just holding a lit one in his hand. Anyway, the Rip Van Winkle caper fits comfortably into my recommendations. Check it out for yourself. Just don't fall asleep while watching. You may wake up 100 years later to find yourself trapped in the Twilight Zone. The silence is unique in the fact that there's no sci-fi or supernatural elements within the story. That doesn't mean it doesn't fit the show, but there are very few episodes that went this route. There's usually always a magic coin, alien, or some kind of unexplainable situation that acts as the basis for an installment of the series. Instead, a strong dislike between the two main characters turns into a twisted bet that by the end becomes a worthy Twilight Zone tale. Jamie Tennyson and Colonel Archie Taylor are members of a frequently attended men's club. Tennyson is infamous for carrying on a conversation for far too long to the point where he never shuts up. He usually even asks for a loan at the end of his rambling. Craving the peace of mind that comes along with silence, Taylor is able to take no more. He presents Tennyson with a formal wager. If he can remain silent for one full year, Taylor will pay him $500,000. Needing the money and eager to prove the older man wrong, Tennyson accepts. And so, the bet begins. Jamie is housed in the old game room of the club, where he is constantly monitored with microphones inside a glass enclosure. As the months go by, Taylor is shocked at how long Tennyson is gone without speaking. This is when he starts to taunt the younger man with ideas of his wife having affairs in her loneliness, among other things. Taylor has crossed the line and made it even more personal. But whose will is stronger? Who among them is the better man? Boris Seagal directed what turned into an excellent and memorable episode. Seagal was the father of Katie Seagal of Married with Children and Sons of Anarchy fame, and helmed one other Twilight Zone installment the following season. He was given a great character piece to direct these actors in, which was a fantastic script to work with by Rod Serling. Serling later admitted that he unconsciously based the story off of Anton Chekhov's The Bet, which had a similar type premise featuring a lawyer and a banker debating if life in prison was worse than the death penalty. Francho Tone and Liam Sullivan were magnificent as Taylor and Tennyson, while Cyril de Levante and Jonathan Harris returned to the Twilight Zone with another pair of great turns supporting the leads. The dialogue, direction, and acting here combined perfectly for a strong on all sides effort. The scenes between Tone and Sullivan were some of the best character sequences of the whole second season. The Tennyson character couldn't respond verbally, so Tone carried the words while Sullivan carried the emotion in his facial expressions. I especially love the monologue where Taylor brings Tennyson's wife into his tempting of Jamie to break the bet. She must be lonely for you, Tennyson. Desperately lonely. She has been seen with other young men. 
He's so slimy with his gravelly voice and suggestive demeanor that you can almost see the underlining distress dripping through his pores. As time goes on, Taylor gets more and more nervous, which makes his reactions to Tennyson's refusal of smaller amounts of money to break the bet clue us in on what might really be going on with him. Just how he's shot in those scenes outside the enclosure make him more predatory, but there's always an unspoken sense of desperation. Funnily enough, those scenes were shot that way out of necessity. Francho Tone completed his first day of shooting this episode, which involved everything in the main room of the men's club, without incident. But when he was supposed to show up for day two of production, he was nowhere to be found. Turns out, he was in a clinic after suffering an injury that scraped the left side of his face raw. Stories differ about how that actually happened, but his wound made it impossible to shoot all of his face while maintaining continuity. Thus, in everything surrounding Tennyson's glass box, Tone was only shown in profile or with the damaged side of his face obstructed. It actually helped the episode and his character in those sequences. But that wasn't the only challenge cinematographer George T. Clements had to overcome with this shoot. Upon seeing the glass room set, he supposedly said he almost lost his lunch. Clements had no idea how he was going to light the set with all the glass reflecting everything, but being the pro he was, he eventually figured it out. By the time they started shooting, he only had to remove about two of the glass panels. To the dismay of Taylor, Tennyson completes the bet. He lasted one full year without speaking a word. When he exits to receive the check from Taylor, the old man has to admit that he doesn't have the money. He lost his fortune years ago. But before Taylor leaves in disgrace, Tennyson forces him to stay and writes a note that reads, I knew I would not be able to keep my part of the bargain. So one year ago, I had the nerves to my vocal cords severed. <sighs> That was one heck of a wicked double twist. Nothing supernatural, but it's certainly deranged. That tear Sullivan dropped made it even more tragic. The story was setting us up for Taylor not having the money. There are hints dropped as early as the first scene, where he refuses to have the check certified and deposited in Tennyson's name ahead of time. The George character also questions his friend about the money later on, but many people likely saw that turn coming. Tennyson having his vocal cords cut was something I did not expect the first time I watched this, and there was no need for an alien to show up or a time travel mechanism to be implemented. This whole thing could plausibly happen, which makes it that much weirder and unsettling. Looking back, there was at least one small hint to this twist nine weeks after the bet started. Franklin, the butler character, tells Taylor that Tennyson wasn't eating very well until eight weeks in. Those first eight weeks were likely when Jamie's throat was recovering from the vocal cord surgery. It'd be hard for him to swallow until the cut on his neck healed. Brilliant stuff. I can't recommend this episode enough. Even if you know the twist going in, it's a fascinating watch that gives you a different experience on multiple viewings. So for 26 minutes, close your mouth, open your eyes, and listen in. Just don't take any long-term bets about how long you can remain silent, because the price for something like that is quite high in the Twilight Zone. Ah, are you the dreamer or merely part of someone's dream? No, you're not watching Batman. Even though that clip is from the Batman the Animated Series episode Perchance to Dream, and The Twilight Zone has an episode called Perchance to Dream, which was written by Charles Beaumont just like this one, you, you know what? Let me start over. We end this year's Twilight Tober Zone with a great installment called Shadow Play. Top talent was involved in the making of this one, and I love myself some well-done existentialism. Charles Beaumont was highly adept at delivering that kind of thing, and this was one of his greatest examples in the series of having the viewer question reality itself. Adam Grant is on trial for murder. After he's sentenced to death, he starts acting like all of this has happened before. From knowing when certain events are going to transpire, to mouthing the words of whoever he's talking to, Grant is pleading with people to listen to him. He says the entire world he currently inhabits is a recurring nightmare that has repeated countless times. Once he's put to death at midnight, everything will reset. 
He tries to convince those around him to stop his execution because even though he lives on in another reset, he feels the pain of dying every time it happens. The district attorney, Henry Ritchie, starts to suspect something strange is going on, but even after meeting with Grant in person, he has a hard time buying the inmate's story. As Grant continues to accurately describe the events of the night, Richie's friend, newspaper editor Paul Carson, has a sinking gut feeling that Grant's words are true and tries to convince Richie that Adam is at least not mentally competent enough to execute. Time takes down to midnight as the suspense builds towards how the evening is going to end. There are a hundred vagrants in every town without names, without history. Stop that! This episode featured a bigger cast than usual, and they all knocked it out of the park. Dennis Weaver as Adam Grant is really outstanding. His sometimes calm, sometimes nervous, almost delirious delivery comes off as manic and unpredictable. It's exactly what this character needed. The scene where he describes his own death by electric chair is chilling. It's aided by some creative split screen that shows what he's describing. They also end that sequence with a somewhat humorous but unsettling cut. Pull the switch. But I think my favorite scene in the whole thing is when a priest tries to comfort him before his execution. Grant is shown trying to figure out where these faces are from in his life, and it's fascinating to watch him attempt to work it out. Father Beeman, from over at Spring Hill. No wonder I didn't recognize you. You died when I was 10 years old. Oh, everybody came to your funeral. A young priest came and took your place. That was Carson. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm using him for the editor. Wonderful character work there. Weaver was primarily known for Gunsmoke at the time, but film fans may remember him best for the 1958 classic Touch of Evil, or one of Steven Spielberg's first features, Duel, which just so happened to be written by regular Twilight Zone scribe Richard Matheson. A few of the other actors also made separate Twilight Zone appearances, like Wright King, Henry Towns, and William Edmondson. They're all great in their different roles and add to the scope of Shadowplay's uncanny story. The scenes that don't involve Grant make you wonder where this is all going and what the truth of the matter really is. John Brom rebounded well after the disappointment of Mr. Dingle the Strong. How this was staged with the camera movements and lighting changes has to be attributed to both he and cinematographer George T. Clements. The shot at the beginning that spotlights our main character before the lights come up to reveal the whole set is superb. Also, Rod Serling has one of his best narrator appearances in the whole show here. His on-camera reveal is great, and his lines at the beginning, and especially the end, are perfect. Adam Grant, a nondescript kind of man found guilty of murder and sentenced to the electric chair. Beaumont and Brom last teamed up as writer and director in another favorite episode of mine from season one, A Nice Place to Visit. It only makes sense that this episode came together so well. Carson is able to convince Richie to call for a stay of execution on the grounds of Adam's supposed insanity. He rings the governor, who's supposed to contact the prison and halt Grant's death, but they're too late. Adam is killed when the executioner flips the switch, and piece by piece, everything begins to disappear and fade away. We then cut to the same scene from the beginning of the story. Adam is on trial again, but the people we saw earlier have switched roles. Grant is doomed to repeat this nightmare for the umpteenth time, and there's no apparent way out of the loop. I love when Beaumont told these kinds of stories. His best episodes were always the bleakest, but they made you think. And while the idea of questioning reality is not new, it may have felt fresh to TV audiences in the early 1960s. The concept of repeating one's death over and over was the center of another John Brom directed episode called Judgment Night. In that one, it seems like the main character is in some sort of purgatory or hell as he pays for his sins. But here, we don't get that kind of information. Does Grant deserve this kind of punishment, or is he an innocent dreamer trapped within his own mind? Is he in a coma? Does he ever wake up after this? We don't know. And that uncertainty makes everything even more disturbing. Go watch this one and revel in its dreadful but deep questions. That'll do it for Twilight Tober Zone this year. Thank you guys for watching and following along in our second go round. Once again, shout out to Mark Zickery's The Twilight Zone Companion book for a lot of the backstage tidbits on the series. Make sure to follow me on social media and subscribe to my personal YouTube channel for more content in the future. You can also stay tuned right here on Channel Awesome for more fan scription and the imminent return of Batman. For now, we exit the Twilight Zone.
But don't worry, that door is always open. Happy Halloween!